Chairman Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India, member of AO Trauma Pediatric Fracture Expert Group for 2016-2018, is member editorial board for journal Strategies in Trauma and Limb Reconstruction, published by Springer Verlag, is a member regional education training team AO Trauma Asia Pacific, a reviewer for articles for the Indian Journal of Orthopedics, past education officer and research officer AO Trauma India, and faculty at numerous AO Trauma international courses. Well, Dr. Hemant Kalyan, sir, is currently the head of the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine at Manipal Hospitals, Bangalore. He has rich 31 years of experience. His subspeciality interests are arthroplasty, arthroscopic surgery, and trauma surgery. As head of the department, he won CNBC TV 18's Healthcare and Wellness Award for 2017 2018 under the category Center of Excellence Orthopedics. Sir has featured among the 25 Economic Times Inspiring Orthopedicians of India in the year 2018. He is regular national and regional AO faculty. He is the first Indian to be awarded Diploma in Sports Medicine by Scottish Royal College in the year 1991. Sir has received a gold medal from Bombay University in 1989 for his MS and DOrth outgoing examinations. Well, if I have to describe Sir his professional qualities, well, he is a man of perfection and he believes in perfection and is dedicated and passionate about what he does and how he interacts about the subject. So I am sure that it is going to be an excellent session from the word go along with both the course directors, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay sir and Dr. Hemant Kalyan sir. So over to you and thank you very much for being with us today once again. Thank you. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. Welcome today to the knee trauma module of the best of orthopedic techniques uh, brought to you from OTA uh, and Insignia. Uh, I think uh, myself, I'm Dr. John Mukhopadhyay from Patna and Dr. Hemant Kalyan from Bangalore will be chairing and moderating these sessions. And we have with us uh, uh, some excellent faculty. We have Dr. Greg De La Roca, from Missouri, Columbia, from the USA. And he's a well-known uh, trauma surgeon who's involved with uh, a lot of the AO courses in uh, the US and worldwide. And also doc, uh, from uh, Kolkata, we have Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee. Uh, he uh, is uh, from my alma mater, that is Jipma Pondicherry. And uh, he is now based in Calcutta in the Columbia Asia Hospital, again, a very good friend of mine and uh, uh, also involved uh, in uh, various AO courses and almost all trauma meetings in India. So with, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, these two faculty and I hand it over to my uh, co-chairman, Dr. Hemant Kalyan to do the honors for the other two faculty. Hemant. Thank you, John. And it's a pleasure to introduce our other OTA faculty Dr. Arvind Van Cadell. He's a trauma surgeon from Harvard Medical Center at Boston, Massachusetts. And he is the director of geriatric trauma, also a researcher in that subject. He has close links to India. As you can see, he has an Indian name, Arvind, born in Bangalore of German parents and visits India more than 25 times, he says, close links with Tamil Nadu. Dindal and something to note for you. Welcome, Arvind. Our other faculty is uh, Dean Dalan. Uh, Dean Dalan is the head of uh, trauma services at Ganga Hospital. Ganga Hospital has made its mark in India as a tremendous center of research and clinical excellence. And Dean Dalan is the key figure for taking care of referral trauma there. So it's a real pleasure to have a good faculty with you and we'll get kick-started with the program. 
Over back to you, John. Okay, so we begin with a couple of lectures on exposures uh, for fractures around the knee, and we would start with Dr. Greg Della Rocca, who's going to tell us about uh, approaches to the knee for trauma, excluding the posterior approaches, which is uh, going to be covered by Dr. Arvind von Kedel. Over to you, Greg. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm going to speak today about uh, approaches to the knee. So I will, uh, these are some of my disclosures. Um, none of them are relevant to this talk or to any of the other talks that I'll be delivering today. So at the conclusion of this lecture, um, hopefully you all be able to understand uh, some of these approaches. And most of them are ones with which you're probably familiar, but I think that the program uh, directors have made a smart uh, decision to have us go through all of these so that we can make sure we're all on the same page. So I'll be speaking about the posterior medial and anterolateral approaches to the proximal tibia, various approaches to the lateral aspect of the distal femur, and an approach to the medial distal femur. I'm not going to speak about posterior approaches to the proximal tibia because uh, Arvind will be doing that uh, straight away after I'm done. So let's think about the posterior medial approach to the proximal tibia. It can be done prone, <clears throat> but it's often done supine because many times we are uh, trying to fix both the medial and the lateral sides of the tibial plateau. Uh, and to do an anterolateral approach is very difficult in the prone position. <clears throat> it's used for the medial or bicondylar types of fractures. Laterally based plates may not capture the fragment well, as you can see in this, uh, in this uh, rendering from a manuscript by David Beret back in 2006, where you can see a posterior medial fracture fragment that is not well captured by screws directed from this particular plate placed anterolaterally. And in reality, the posterior medial fragment is the most important fragment. It is the constant fragment and it is the fragment to which you need to bring the rest of the tibia. So if we <clears throat> discuss the posterior medial approach, uh, you can see here uh, the lateral, excuse me, a medial view of the knee and the incision basically comes directly over the pes anserine uh, just anterior to where the medial collateral ligament is, or really right over the medial collateral ligament. This is a uh, diagram or a picture from Dr. Bure at Harborview Medical Center showing the incision. The incision comes down, you will divide the sartorius fascia, and you will see the gracilis and semitendinosus tendons. You can see them here, they're labeled as pes anserinus. And then you can see in the depths, of the incision, the medial collateral ligament. Here are a couple of cadaveric dissections showing the gracilis and semitendinosus, along with the semimembranosus on the right side. So you can see where these insertions are. I don't generally remove these insertions. I will work around the tendons and you can mobilize them as you can see with retractors. The gracilis and semitendinosus both have Fascial attachments to the medial head of the gastrocnemius, which you may need to incise so that you can mobilize these tendons properly. Then you come down and you can move the gastrocnemius off of the posterior medial border of the proximal tibia. I usually elevate it with a soft tissue elevator and almost always you will find your fracture line right underneath. So you can see here ways to access this include using a bump, which is placed beneath the thigh and beneath the ankle. And it can be a little bit difficult to get your proper orientation for screws uh, because the bed is in the way. You can see how this would be easier to do in a prone position, but most of the time we do it supine. This is the exposure and you can see uh, with the pes anserine tendons retracted anteriorly, you can see the fracture line. Then with some accessory incisions, you can apply clamps, Remember, we're reducing the tibia to the posterior medial fragment. And then you can place a plate posterior medially through this incision. This is another example of a plate being applied beneath the, the PES tendons, demonstrating posterior medial buttressing. Now, if we turn to the anterolateral approach, this is used for most bicondylar and lateral tibial plateau fractures. 
I will speak about using single versus dual plates later for bicondylar fractures. Use, these are usually done supine. The fibular head is in the way of some fracture patterns, in which case a direct posterior approach may be appropriate or a fibular osteotomy. And Arvind will talk about this in a little bit. So the anterolateral exposure is generally a lazy S type of incision. It's centered over Gertie's tubercle, which is the insertion of the iliotibial band. <clears throat> I usually incise the iliotibial band in the anterior compartment fascia in line with the surgical incision in the skin, and I elevate it directly off of the bone. You can see that here. And then I can perform a submeniscal arthrotomy once I've developed my plane in between the lateral knee capsule and the iliotibial band. And I will usually use, in this case, uh, we've used some ethabon suture, uh, which is a polyethyl, excuse me, a polyester heavy suture. Uh, but sometimes I'll use a fiber wire or some other similar type of suture that has a very heavy core. Um, at this time, this is when I can actually find peripheral meniscal detachments, which happen quite often with tibial plateau fractures, and I can perform a repair of the peripheral detachment to the lateral capsule. Importantly, these sutures are grabbing the meniscus, not just the capsule. And I've left a capsular attachment on the proximal tibia so that I can repair it later. Then you can see you can apply distractors and go through your entire procedure of fixing the fracture. And, uh, and then the closure <clears throat> is very straightforward. Now, if we go to the distal femur, <clears throat> approaches to the lateral distal femur are used for most distal femur fractures. These, of course, are not appropriate for isolated medial condyle fractures. There's not really a lot of danger in the lateral distal femur. You should expect to encounter and probably sacrifice the superior lateral geniculate artery. It will always be there during your exposure. You may be able to preserve it, but it's unlikely. Uh, the good news is, is that there are lots of <clears throat> geniculate arteries. So if you have to uh, sacrifice this one, it's usually not a big issue. So the anterolateral approach, generally I use a laterally based incision, but then I curve slightly anterior and I head towards Gertie's tubercle or the tibial tubercle. I usually don't have to extend much further, but if needed, I could extend it down the leg uh, and just incorporate this into an anterolateral approach to the proximal tibia. Then what I will do is I'll identify the iliotibial band fibers and then I'll incise these in line with the skin incision. Okay, and you can actually see the fibers that usually this is pretty well delineated. And then I will go and I usually will stay outside of the periosteum as much as possible, elevate the vastus lateralis anteriorly. And again, you will encounter the superior lateral geniculate artery in this location. And I will usually sacrifice this. Usually we'll control it with electric artery, but sometimes it's big enough that it needs to be controlled with vascular clips. Then when you're done, you can get down to the, lat to the lateral capsule and you can incise the capsule. Usually I do this anteriorly over the lateral ridge of the trochlea and you can then expose inside the knee if needed. You can see that right here. For extensively comminuted fractures, sometimes we can use an anterior midline incision. And then you can use either lateral parapetellar or medial parapetellar, you would often need to use a second incision to insert your plate. You can use a modified anterolateral incision, which is also called a swashbuckler approach, which was uh, described in Dallas, actually, and uh, many surgeons have done this. And so, um, but this is what it, what it can look like where you have a midline incision, as you see here, and then you can raise a lateral flap you see the vastus lateralis, and then you make your incision in the same location as you would for the deep dissection for the lateral approach. The difference is, is that the skin incision is anterior and you get better exposure anteriorly. And you can see a large exposure here of the distal femur. Finally, uh, medial approaches to the distal femur. These include subvastus or Southern approaches. There are a lot of different names. They're good for visualization of medial condyle fractures and maybe good for bicondylar fractures and especially 
if you're planning on doing medial and lateral plating. So you can see here, you can do an anterior midline skin incision if needed, but I would be a little bit careful about this if you're going to do a lateral incision as well. Uh, then you can come down anterior to the medial lateral ligament, or you can go posterior if needed to visualize posterior medial condyle fractures. You can get very nice exposure as you see here. You can get to most of the medial condyle through an arthrotomy anterior to the medial lateral ligament but you can also go posterior if needed. So thank you, and I'll move on to the next talk. Thank you, Dr. Dr. De La Roca. And uh, we'd invite Dr. Arvind to complete the surgical approaches with posterior shear tibial plateau fractures. Over to Arvind. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. So I will be talking about the posterior approach to the proximal tibia. And um, we will start off with a case um, just to highlight some of the reasons why to go posterior. So this is a 30 year old male who was involved in a motor vehicle accident. He has no medical history um, and then um, has pain around the right knee. Uh, here her is uh, AP and lateral x-rays of the tibia. You can see a, pro um, a fibula fracture and then something doesn't just look right uh, with the proximal tibia. We'll get a CT scan uh, with the three cuts, the axial, coronal, and sagittal. And I would like to um, turn your attention to the axial cut, which is the most important cut where you see a posterior medial as well as a posterior lateral fragment um, um, on the axial cut. And that's really uh, important to see because that will probably guide your surgical approach to say, well, I do not have to go lateral, so I probably should go prone because um, um, uh, to really try to capture the, the posterior lateral fragment. Here are some 3D reconstruction cuts where you can again see the posterior lateral component of this uh, proximal tibia fracture. And intraoperatively, um, it is incredibly important that before you start any posterior approaches, you check your fluoroscopy because uh, it is incredibly um, challenging if uh, the contralateral leg is in the way and you cannot see your uh, lateral. And that will require um, appropriate bumps and, and uh, uh, in the right location to, to keep the um, x-ray clear of the other leg. And here you can see the, the, the plate application capturing both segments, the posterior medial and posterior lateral fragment. So how do you get there? So there's a, a couple of different described techniques. I'll go through some of them. The Lobenhofer uh, approach um, is essentially somewhat similar to the uh, posterior medial approach that uh, Greg just covered. It is essentially in the prone position, you uh, find the medial border of the tibia and make about a six to eight centimeter long incision along the medial head of the grass rock and, um, and then dissect down to the fascia. You can also do that on the posterior lateral side um, um, as alluded earlier today, where you just essentially uh, do the same idea. You, you go along the posterior lateral or around the lateral um, head of the gas rock you do have to find the common perineal nerve to really um, protect it. And in case where the main fracture line is um, right behind the fibula head, you can also empl employ a fibula osteotomy. These are some clinical pictures. Here you can see the patient in the prone position. Um, and then usually uh, you uh, mark out your incision, you dissect down through the subcutaneous tissue, identify the fascia of the gas truck, and then the PEZ, which comes in um, sort of reverse because uh, it, it seems a little odd as you're lying prone. And then essentially you just lift off the entire medial head of the gas truck off the uh, posterior aspect of the tibia. Then you can incise the popliteus muscle and clear out the fracture. These are some clinical pictures from this case uh, where the patient is in a prone position. Retractor placement is incredibly important in this approach. I use a, what's called a Norfolk retractor, which you can see with a red dot on it and just a blunt home and to go over to the lateral side. And, and with that, you usually get adequate visualization. 
In case you are unable to do that, you can dissect um, in the um, uh, uh, more proximally and in fact, release some of the medial head of the gas truck. That usually requires that you uh, incise um, along the crease to the lateral side and sometimes even further up. And that sometimes can help to, to gain you uh, more access more posterior laterally. This is this long-term follow-up. So again, the, the most important uh, thing is when you look at um, axial CT cuts to really make sure that um, you scrutinize for any um, posterior lateral in, in, in addition to sometimes posterior medial fracture components. These are sort of shear fractures that really are important to remember that um, in that case, I think going posterior will help you to uh, reduce the fracture and to fix the fracture appropriately. Again, this is sort of a, a study that um, highlights this point of the posterior medial and posterior lateral fracture fragment. Uh, in general, this is just a small paper, a small case series um, that um, looked at uh, outcomes of posterior tibial plateau fracture fixation. In general, they do quite okay. Uh, in, in my hands, I do like to place them in a, a knee mobilizer for two weeks because uh, the scarring and the posterior aspect of the knee can make it difficult for patients to get full extension. So I keep them uh, for um, two weeks, uh, uh, sort of either locked in extension or just in a new mobilizer to, to um, allow them to really regain that uh, full extension back. And um, as not surprising, this is another study that came out of my institution that uh, looked at this and, and uh, there is no question that um, the, there is a correlation between the articular reduction and the functional outcome scores. With that, I'd like to conclude and hand it back over to the moderators. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Arvind. That was uh, very precise and good. Uh, we don't have uh, questions and answers for these first two talks, but if there are any burning questions, we can take them later. We now go on to the next session, which is on distal femur fractures. And I invite uh, Greg to give his talk on intraarticular distal femur fractures. Af sorry, uh, after each lecture, there's going to be five minutes for question and answers. So please send in your questions and we will try to take them at the end of the talk. Thank you. Greg. Very good. So thank you. And uh, I'm going to speak about distal femur fractures now for a few minutes. <clears throat> These are some uh, rather complex fractures, and uh, but they're fun to fix. And um, unfortunately, we see tons of them. And uh, uh, they can be rather disabling, as you know. So our treatment goals for distal femur fractures are anatomic reduction of the articular fragments, restoration of axial alignment of the limb, which includes length, alignment, and rotation. We want to have st stable enough fixation that we can start early motion for the knee, and we want to prevent them from collapsing into varus. And I think that's the most important thing to remember. So things for you to remember. So first of all, there is a unique geometry and anatomy of the distal femur that we need to respect and restore. Our fixation strategy is based on the type of fracture pattern, whether it's an A, B, or C type. Uh, and I'll go through each of those briefly, including the A types, even though this is about articular fractures. We want to get an anatomic articular reduction, correct our axial alignment, and then we want to understand our implants before we use them. So it's very important to know what implants you're using. So remember, the femur is always trying to go into varus. That's based on its anatomy. It wants to fall into varus. So our job is to prevent it from doing so. And we can do that either with implants or with a combination of implants and the bone itself, and especially in the setting of minimal comminution. So remember the distal femur geometry, the mechanical axis of the leg falls through the center of the knee. Uh, and there's about five to nine degrees of valgus in the distal femur, okay? But noting that the mechanical axis falls medial to the shaft of the femur, means that despite the distal femoral valgus, the femur is going to want to fall into varus if it fails. 
Also remember the distal femur is a trapezoid if looked at end on. There is about a 10 degree internal rotation of the lateral cortex. So <clears throat> when you are ready to apply your implants, these are designed, the, the special shape is designed to accommodate this 10 degree internal rotation. So think about internally rotating your plate when you apply it to the distal femur. Also notice that the shaft is above the junction of the anterior and middle third of the femoral condyles. So you can see on the left, there is a, there is a nail that comes down and notice it comes pretty anterior in the distal femur. So if you want to align a plate, like a blade plate with the rest of the femur, it needs to be positioned anteriorly, which you can see with the shaded box labeled W in the right hand image. If you're too posterior, then not only will the distal femur not align properly with the shaft as you see here on the lateral view, but you also get what's called a golf club or a hockey stick type of deformity. And what happens is, is the plate will drive the distal femur medially and you'll get a deformity like this every time. So make sure your plate's not too posterior. And this is what it can look like when that happens. Hopefully you won't have this. And then remember, as we're reducing the fractures, we have lots of deforming forces that we need to work against, including the quadriceps anteriorly, <clears throat> the adductor muscles medially, and the gastrocnemius, which is the real thing that we have to work against, which is always pulling the distal femur into the deformity that you see here. So we talked about surgical approaches already, lots of different ways to get to where we need to go. And then remember the fracture pattern will ultimately determine direct versus indirect reduction techniques, especially if there's lots of comminution. Uh, if there is articular involvement, then we need to get a direct reduction. Absolute versus relative stability is also based on the fact fracture pattern. Uh, the type of dissection and approach that you'll use is based on your fracture pattern and of course, implant choice as well. So you need to understand the injury. And the way to do this is to make sure you have appropriate x-rays and CT scans when you can get them. Remember that up to 40% of distal femur fractures have coronal plane fractures or posterior condylar fractures. These are most precisely diagnosed with CT scan. So these should be planned surgeries. These are not things where you just show up and just start going. You need to understand the injury before you start. So let's briefly talk about the different types of fractures with some cases. These are two patients. One was in a car crash at the top and one was a gunshot wound at the bottom. You can see two different types of extra articular distal femur fractures. They can be simple metaphyseal or comminuted. So immediately you should be thinking, well, the simple metaphyseal fracture may be able to be reduced directly, maybe some lag screws placed and then neutralized with a plate. Whereas the bottom set of fractures might be amenable to bridge plating because with all the degree of comminution, it's gonna be very difficult to get a perfect anatomical reduction of every fragment. And so you can see here using soft tissue sparing techniques, using strategically placed clamps on the top, we can achieve a direct reduction. Uh, whereas on the bottom, we're mostly looking to restore alignment, okay? And we can get everything aligned through use of various things, including femoral distractor or table traction, or just using an assistant to help along with bumps placed in an appropriate position. And then you can see uh, absolute stability with a neutralization plate and lag screws at the top, and then a bridge plating construct at the bottom. What about for B-type fractures? <clears throat> well, this is a patient who was involved in a car crash. <clears throat> and if you look very carefully, you'll see that there seems to be just a little bit of irregularity of the lateral condyle. Well, this is very important to identify because even though that doesn't look too bad, if you get some extra imaging, you can see clearly that that is a huge lateral condylar fragment and it's also articular. You can see on the lateral view on the right that there's articular involvement. Obviously we would use a CT scan for full delineation of this injury. This is a B-type fracture. It's just the lateral condyle in this case. Uh, and in this case, the goal is to do some type of buttress if you can. So if it's purely articular fracture, you may not be able to do that, uh, but independent screws and then a buttress plate if necessary. And if you're able, and you can see how this was done <clears throat> using a primarily medial approach here. Okay, so multiple lag screws, 
Uh, many of these are buried or immediately on the articular margin and then a plate placed in buttress fashion to avoid the articular surface. What about C-type fractures? These are the ones that are, uh, have lots of articular involvement. So this is a patient who was involved in a car crash, is about 35 years old. And you can see that there's long extension into the diaphysis for this fracture. But you can also see if you look carefully, especially on the anteroposterior image, you can see the articular split, maybe with a tiny bit of comminution. <clears throat> and so this was fixed uh, using an open approach through the through an anterolateral exposure, we were able to get into the joint. We were able to see the articular surface. We reduced it, placed lag screws, and then applied a neutralization plate after clamping along the diaphysis. You can see that here, multiple clamps applied. This obviously wouldn't happen for a highly comminuted fracture. I'm not sure that a femoral distractor is needed in this case where we have a perfect, or excuse me, an articulated tensioning device is needed for when you have a perfect reduction as you see here, but you can see the reduction and this would be what it looks like intraoperatively where you don't have to make a huge incision to apply a large plate. And this is what the patient looked like when they were done. So let's talk about articular reduction briefly in the last minute or so. If you have comminuted fractures, you wanna consider reducing the medial condyle fracture first. If you can see this, you can do it through a separate medial incision but sometimes you can get to it through your lateral incision. You see you need to move the patella out of the way, which you can do with Holman retractors. Um, and then you have to be careful placing this clamp, but this is possible to do through your lateral or anterolateral exposure or even an anterior exposure. Um, just you're in front of the cruciate ligaments. You may need to remove the ligamentum that is in the way, uh, but you leave the ligaments alone. For the lateral condyle, also known as a Hoffa fragment, uh, you can apply clamps as you see here, and then the intercondylar split. And this is where you have to be really careful because most often you reduce the intercondylar split with a clamp like this, but you can see that it gaps the posterior aspect of the fracture. You need to be aware that this is going to happen and work against it. And one way to do that is to apply another clamp to an accessory medial incision uh, that you can see here with the clamp applied a little bit more posteriorly, it reduces the fracture nicely. And then remember, it's all about length, alignment, and rotation. You need to know your implants. So when you put your screws in, independent lag screws, they're not going to get in the way of the particular plate that you're using. And then remember, where you put your plate is going to drive your alignment. And in fact, if you put your plate on properly, it can help actually drive your reduction. So for example, here's an articular fracture of a patient with a prior anterior cruciate ligament injury and an appropriately placed plate can actually drive the distal femur into position. But if you place it incorrectly, you'll get the golf club problem. And this is what this patient looked like at the end. So remember, unique geometry and anatomy for the distal femur, fixation strategies based on the fracture pattern, you want to get an anatomical reduction of the articular surface and then get your axial alignment either directly or indirectly. And then always understand your implant. So you make sure you put it in the same, in the correct place so that you don't end up causing a deformity. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Greg. Uh, so we'll take some questions on this talk and, uh, well, I'll start the ball rolling with, uh, Greg, you didn't talk about double plating, and there's been a lot of literature and controversy over this uh, in the recent uh, literature. And uh, when do you decide to put a second plate? Because personally, in my practice, I use it really rarely and very uh, uh, specifically for certain type of fractures. But uh, there's been a lot of things saying, oh, you must use a double plate or some medial fixation. And when do you think it's really necessary? Yeah, so, so I would suggest that anybody who says that you must use a double plate is wrong. Um, so, however, I think that that double plating is a very powerful tool. Um, and uh, I, I would encourage, this will be a plug for the Orthopedic Trauma Association meeting. Um, please do attend uh, because there will be some presentations on dual plating or nail and plate combinations used for distal femur fractures. So please do 
Uh, try to attend the Orthopedic Trauma Association meeting if you can, either virtually or in person. We would love to see you in the United States if you are able to travel in October to Dallas. So um, I use dual plating when I have a large amount of comminution in the metaphysis. There is no question that we have survived many years with just lateral plates. Um, the truth of the matter is that blade plates are probably more stable than the current locking plate designs, okay? So, so I wonder if some of the problems that we've seen with uh, failure in varus with single plates are, prob are potentially more related to the use of the newer plates, which are easier to use than blade plates, as opposed to the use of plate plates uh, historically. But that being said, it's also entirely possible that we just didn't have good follow-up many, many years ago with blade plates. So we don't know what happened to some of these patients. So I use medial plates fairly routinely. Uh, the approach to the medial distal femur makes people very nervous because they're worried about the blood vessels. But the truth of the matter is, is that we know the anatomy if you're going to be going over there, you know the anatomy, you know what you need to avoid, and it's a very simple dissection. And usually all I will do is I'll use a, I'll use a small fragment plate uh, to go on that side just to provide medial support. Um, but again, the most important thing is to achieve the correct reduction. And then if I feel that I'm missing a lot of bone medially because it's comminuted, that's when I'll put the medial plate on. And I do it quite routinely. And it uh, takes a little bit of extra time, but it makes us all feel better. Uh, any of the other faculty want to chime in on that? Because I, I can't agree more with Greg. I, I think the, the, the do not hesitate to go medial if you think you need to. And in general, my, my practice, I usually go medial if the if there's a large metaphysical component that's, that's ranging between six to 10 centimeters and, and I, I just do not trust my laterally based locked implant. But then as Greg also mentioned, you can, if you anticipate that, you can probably go to a blade plate um, just from the get-go if you're facile with that. One brief note in terms of implants, um, um, we or I do use a lot of the synthes implants because there's no specific implant for the medial side. So you can use a contralateral flipped upside down proximal tibia plate to apply to the medial uh, distal femur. Or sometimes if, if um, uh, you can also just use an LCDC plate um, and then stick it into the canal and try to shoot over from the lateral side through the, the other um, screw holes. So you can do that too as a sort of a strut on the medial side. Both options are reasonable. Yes, and, and Arvin made a very nice point about an intramedullary plate. Um, and that's a technique that was written many years ago by uh, Jeff Ma. Yeah. Um, and it's a very powerful technique. It sometimes uh, <clears throat> takes a little bit of extra effort and finesse to get it done properly, um, but it works very, very nicely. And then there's the possibility of medial, uh, medial implant prominence. But if you position your plates appropriately on the medial side of the femur, uh, I think you'll probably be okay. I usually just use uh, an LCDC plate. So, uh, a standard plate and then I contour it. But also uh, people have used proximal humerus plates. That's an off-label use um, of the plate because it's designed to be put on the proximal humerus and not the femur, but, it's, but it does fit there with very slight modifications. How are we doing for time? I think we are just ready to start your talk, John. So... Okay. Uh, so our next talk is going to be by uh, by our co-chairman, uh, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay, and he'll be talking about malunions of the distal femur. Yeah, so this is an area which is not often covered uh, very much in uh, trauma meetings, and uh, uh, it's interesting that we see a lot more of these today, especially with the minimally invasive techniques being done. Uh, basically, no real conflict of interest as far as this presentation is concerned. Uh, I will go straight uh, to a case 
that we dealt with some years ago, which was uh, a 60-year-old man who had a distal femur fracture, which was treated by, with uh, DCS many years ago. And um, this plate was removed after three years, but he came to us 12 years after that original fixation, complaining of increasing pain and difficulty in walking. And those were his x-rays. And uh, you can see the marked virus on the left side, and you can see the virus thrust when he's walking. Okay, so you need to do your long leg films whenever you're analyzing these uh, distal femur malunions, and then you would, for intra-articular malunions, of course, you would need a CT scan. But here it was mostly an extra-articular problem. So you do your um, mechanical axis uh, measurements, and you can see in this that although it's a malunion of the femur, the problem is not just in the femur. Uh, of course, the femur has significant uh, virus, as you can see from the mechanical lat lateral distal femur angle, but he also has virus of the proximal tibia, as you can see in the medial proximal tibial angle. So you, to deal with this, you need to deal with both the deformities so that you get a good correction. So that is what we did. We did a closing wedge lateral uh, distal femur osteotomy uh, with a standard approach. And we also did a high tibial osteotomy using uh, the techniques that have been described in the Tomofix uh, method of doing that, which is, uh, again, using angle-stable implants to fix your osteotomies. No bone graft, even though you have quite a big correction on both sides. So this is the femur, which is a closing wedge. And this was the tibia, which is an opening wedge osteotomy, okay? So, and this is him post-op. You can see a good correction of the overall alignment, uh, looking at both uh, the AP and lateral X-rays. Uh, this is him at six months follow-up. And it's interesting, if you look at the X-rays, how his uh, hip, which was uh, knee, which was much worse earlier, looks a lot better than his opposite knee, which uh, is now going into virus. And this is him again at three years, six months uh, post-op. You can see he's got virus thrust on the opposite side and I've suggested an osteotomy to him on that side, but with this COVID outbreak, he's waiting for this to get over before he comes in for surgery for the opposite side. But you can see how the knee has held out so much better on the left side because the alignment has been corrected adequately. Uh, again, as I mentioned, not so much in the literature for post-traumatic Malunions, here are a couple of papers, one by Michael Miranda from the US and the other one is from Italy, which looks at the challenges of dealing with non-unions and malunions in distal femur surgical revision. But the other area which we see quite a lot of are these intra-articular malunions. And again, this is an area where we don't have too much on the literature. And this is an interesting case. This was a young girl. She was about 16 or 17 when she came to us and had an injury about nine months earlier, uh, which was treated in a cast, uh, 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 sorry, some years ago, two years ago. And he was treated, she was treated in a cast for six weeks and she developed a full flexion, okay? But she was unable to extend her knee properly, okay? So, and if you look at the CT scan, you can see this step off here. So this was a off a fracture, which was probably not uh, recognized adequately and she was treated uh, conservatively. And although she had full flexion, as you will see, she had this fixed flexion deformity, which you could not correct even passively. So this is on the table. You can see that she's got full flexion, but even under anesthesia, she's got this fixed flexion deformity of the knee. And this was almost two years down the line. So it was really a difficult decision to do something because of the full flexion that she had. And we were worried that if she loses flexion, uh, we would uh, be unhappy about that and she would be unhappy about that. But interestingly, when whatever you see on the CT, when you actually look inside the knee, the step off is really much more severe than it looked on the x-rays or the CT. You can see this big step off. This is the posterior fragment. This is the anterior part of the condyle. And so we did an osteotomy through the fracture line more or less. Uh, we tried to separate out the, so on the image, that's how we did the osteotomy. We took out a wedge of tissue, which was a combination of callus and fibrous tissue here. And uh, then we had 
to get this back to the original place. And this was not easy because of the delay. So we had to use a, a combination of clamps to pull it and uh, 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 another clamp to try and uh, uh, clamp it together, uh, something to lever it. We was, because we were trying to maintain the soft tissue attachment on this posterior fragment. But uh, gradually, with some time spent, we were able to get it reduced adequately, as you can see here now. Uh, we fixed it with these three screws that were countersunk and in compression by overdrilling the proximal area. I prefer these fully threaded screws with overdrilling to the partially threaded screws because I find they seem to hold better, but that's a personal choice. And uh, this is her at about nine months post-op, and this is her at four years, six months follow-up. You can see how uh, nicely she's corrected up. Uh, she's got married and has a child now. And uh, so we were lucky in this one. We managed to get a good result. But uh, in a situation like this, where the function preoperatively is reasonably good, the decision-making can be more difficult. Again, uh, the, the literature is mainly those of case reports. Here's one uh, from Japan on correction of an uh, uh, osteotomy for a malunited Hoffa. There have been a few others using image uh, sort of navigation and one even is doing a navigation for a total knee replacement for a malunited distal femur fracture. Uh, here again, you can have uh, intra uh, articular malunions in older patients. And here again, the decision is, do you leave it uh, till things get bad enough and do a total knee replacement or you try and do something for it? So you can see this is a, a medial uh, condyle fracture, which is displaced. You can see the step off here. And she had a fixed flexion deformity of about uh, 20 degrees and a range of motion till about 80 degrees. So here we have to again go through the previous fracture line, get it reduced. We use this postromedial buttress, a T-plate. This is the regular uh, T-plate and then a couple of leg screws across the reduced fracture. This is at about four months post-op and this is about a year and three months post-op when she came recently. You can see she is reasonably well aligned, same as the opposite side. And she's got uh, full extension and about 100 degrees of flexion at this stage. So doing reasonably well uh, in this situation. So again, uh, again, a case report of a malunion of the medial femoral condyle with a uh, osteotomy. Uh, we also get these. Uh, this is an unusual case. We presented to us about four and a half months after injury. Uh, you can see the grossly displaced of our element to the fracture on the lateral side. Uh, those were the CT scans. And this patient, for some reason, had been neglected and treated conservatively. I think initially he went to a bone setter and he came to us at uh, four and a half months with almost no motion in the knee. And this is, again, a difficult situation. You need to go in, uh, you need to mobilize the fragments. You can see there's some articular comminution as well, but you try to get it as well reduced as possible. Uh, we put in these lag screws. We actually put him on skeletal traction with CPM after this because we couldn't get uh, more uh, more rigid fixation with the plate because there was no beak to the fracture. And this is him at 10 months. Uh, luckily, he got back good motion and did very well as well. So uh, I think uh, the take-home messages, I think distal femoral malunions are not uncommon. I think uh, the literature is really not so... Uh, uh, abundant about it. Uh, ideally, you want to do the osteotomy at the site of deformity, but you need to really assess the malunion adequately in terms of exactly where the site is and decide your osteotomies accordingly. I think the results have definitely improved with better techniques and there's been a lot of newer sort of techniques involved, especially with the use of the uh, angle stable implants. But you have to choose your indications carefully and then uh, be able to deliver uh, adequate correction of the problem to get good results. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was uh, excellent clinical material and very well done. Uh, so the whole question, I guess, in these uh, malunions, extra-articular malunions, when do you decide that you are going to do a, a knee replacement as a primary procedure and what are your criteria for doing osteotomy? I mean, uh, how do you decide this? The extra mal extra articular malunions is pretty easy. So I would 
try to correct the deformity rather than do a, a total knee replacement. I think for the intra-articular ones, it's a little more difficult and it would depend on the duration. Uh, are there already arthritic changes in the joint and how bad they are? And uh, also on the age of the patient. So, so the last one, which was a slightly older patient, but uh, we thought we'll give it a try. And it's a discussion you have with the patient. Okay, so I think in that older patient, maybe someone else might decide to wait and when things get bad enough, do a total knee replacement. But I felt that we could still get that malunion reduced and get a decent correction. I think uh, for extra articular malunions, essentially as long as the knee hasn't become arthritic beyond a stage where you feel that an osteotomy is not going to work. So, yeah. And very often, I think the uh, x-ray picture is a little misleading. You might see some medial compartmental arthritis. But once you unload the knee by realigning the limb, they improve. Yeah. What's so, the experience of the other uh, faculty, Dean Dalen and others? You must be doing similar cases. Sir. No, we, we also do the osteotomies and then corrections of the intraarticular uh, thing. But sometimes... We also had problems with fitness, like uh, especially the one that Hofas we were correcting. We yeah. ended up having a lot of uh, stiffness. So I think Hofas is something, Hofas small union is something is difficult to correct, I suppose. So. Yeah, so I think with Hofas, you have to be careful. Uh, what we do for them is at about six to eight weeks, if they're not getting motion, we do an uh, arthroscopic arthrolysis. Okay, so that would... Uh, greatly increase your chances of getting good motion. Okay, so I think uh, it's important to do that in good time because if you wait too long, then it becomes more difficult. So, uh, John, there's a question from Dr. Sanjay Dhawan. Uh, yeah. In two of the cases, you know, the intraarticular uh, osteotomies which you did, you did only screw fixation. So, he's wondering about the specific reason for not using a buttress plate. You partly answered this, but maybe we can tell them once again. Yeah, so basically, see, the, uh, the ideal position to buttress them is at the beak, okay? So if they don't have a beak, it becomes difficult to buttress it. Okay, if you put just a lateral plate, it really isn't going to work as a buttress because the beak, if it's anywhere, it's posterior. And so if, the, if you saw the case where it was a slightly larger fragment with the beak going into the metaphysis, we buttressed it posteromedially. Uh, but these ones which are intra entirely intra-articular, it becomes difficult to actually buttress it. You may put a lateral plate with a screw anterior and posterior, but if you get really good compression across, and the first one was a young, these were both young patients, so I, I was able to get really nice compression with these three screws, which I felt was adequate fixation. Yeah, but yes, I did. you can buttress it, definitely buttressing makes a difference. I did notice that the 16-year-old girl whom you showed, there was a through cast X-ray, which you... Yeah, so initially, just immediate post-op, but then we mobilized her quite early after that. It was just a slab, actually. So we do often keep them in a slab for a couple of days. Uh, yeah. So, coming from the OTA faculty on their experiences, Greg... Hey. I think um, um, sometimes it becomes, uh, I mean, beautiful cases that you showed, uh, really amazing work. I, I think um, sometimes with the extra articular uh, malunions, it is a little bit difficult intraoperatively to understand whether you've corrected appropriately or not. And um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on how you how you assess that. And then I can, um, I guess, briefly uh, touch on what I use. We always do the cable... Uh, test intraoperatively. So we use the Bowie wire from the center of the hip to the center of ankle and have it passing through the center of the knee. Uh, but I think your preoperative assessment is really important as well. So I think this getting these angles uh, sort of in your mind before you start is important. So you know where you're correcting them and how much correction you need. And of course, we look at it as well. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, a couple of the things that, that I'm usually doing for if I have to do a deformity correction is uh, number one, I mean, I usually just make sure I have images of the contralateral side. I try to get yeah. those beforehand and usually plain films. I'm not talking about CRM images. 
But the other thing uh, that I found helpful is that since the C-arm is difficult to assess the overall alignment because it's a very, very restricted field, um, I will get intraoperative plane films of the femur as well and review those. So, um, you know, those are just some things that, that I found helpful because um, sometimes it can be difficult uh, to, and then I, I always really make sure that I get my rotation correct as well. And, and I'll do that. Uh, I usually just use a C-arm technique where I look at the lesser trochanteric profile uh, and I compare it to a direct AP anteroposterior posterior image of the knee. So I have the patella specifically positioned so that the inferior pole overlaps the top of the, the very top of the notch or the trochlea on the distal femur. And I make sure that those are the same on both sides. So that's, those are some little we tricks. We also use navigation actually. So to look at the alignment and we've actually tried it. The thing is when you're doing high tibial osteotomies, most of these navigation need you to open the joint, which we don't do when we are just doing a straightforward HDO. But for these uh, patients where we have to open the joint, we can actually uh, uh, maybe even try to do uh, intraoperative uh, navigation to check the alignments as well. Yeah, I, I, I essentially use the same techniques with the bovi cord. You just have to be careful to uh, avoid parallax because it will um, yeah. uh, um, make sure yeah. you, you're, you have to be very careful. And also... Um, to ensure that your distal bovi cord is in the in the center of both of the malleoli, not actually of the distal tibia, because yeah. otherwise you induce uh, a malalignment. And I usually check the rotation of the contralateral side before I prep. I usually use all possibilities to minimize the the risk of malrotation or malalignment, because that is <laughs> it's very easy to do. A quick note, and I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts um, for proximal tibia or distal femur intraarticular model unions, I have started to use the intraoperative CT scans because I, I do we do have the ability and, and I do think that it's sometimes hard to really understand on a 2D x-ray the ad, uh, adequate um, reduction, if, especially if it's more complex. Have, have any of you had the chance to try that or anybody any experience? So we don't have access to intraoperative CT, but we certainly, so it's important to study your CT. We do a lot of intraarticular malunions for the proximal tibia. So we have actually a whole series of cases which we hope to be reporting soon. But uh, so uh, we don't have intraoperative CT, unfortunately. So yeah, I I'm sure you have much more experience than actually we do. We, we see it very rarely. We, we see it very rarely. And that's why I think, I, 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 you know, because the technology, we do have the technology and, and, and I have changed my management intraoperatively after getting a, a, a CT. We've had one posteromedial fragment that was, um, had a large gap about a, you know, half a centimeter. And it was a little bit tricky to see because you can't really see the articular reduction properly. So that was helpful for that. Okay. I think uh, we are playing out of time now. So interesting discussion. So we go on to the next talk, which we have Dr. Dean Allen from Quimbuto. He's going to talk about distal femur gaps, how you deal with them. So over to you, Didi. Thank you, John. So <clears throat> we do get to see a lot of uh, distal femur bone loss purely because we do treat a lot of open injuries. So we all know that any critical bone defect is something like greater than two centimeter of gap, or if the circumference is more than 50%, you consider it as a critical bone defect. I said that we, uh, we do a lot of uh, open injuries and you get to see patients, either they lose their fragment in the, during the accident or at the time of debridement, you need to take out a lot of bone fragments. And that is why they end up with bone gap. Last uh, year, like during the pandemic year of 2020, we saw 479 patients of them, distal femur was 53 fracture open injuries. Among them, 16 were uh, having a bone loss. That means 30% of them had a bone loss. So this bone loss is managing them is a major challenge. It requires multiple treatment options and methods. It, though there is uh, multiple options, but there is no comparative evidence. There is no good series about comparative evidence. 
we also know that a distal femur bone loss can end up having a spontaneous regeneration and this is one of the patient who developed a spontaneous regeneration we just went ahead to fix it at the end and then he gets a good function on the contrary sometimes they also can end up with secondary amputation if you think of salvage it can also end up with secondary amputation sometimes amputation is extremely like it's a difficult decision to make there is little consensus nerve injury and soft tissue injury are important prognostic indicator so in the beginning to convince them for an amputation sometimes is extremely difficult however when you plan for a reconstruction various treatments are there see for example it's you can also manage with bone grafts or a fibular strut graft or even complete uh, uh, autografts and allografts combination and then you can also think of a limb limb reconstruction system where you can do a bone transport procedure the reamer irrigator aspirator technique for bone graft and masculet technique are also being described however the limb reconstruction system is something that is commonly used you can also do a shortening of the limb with a good fixation and then later on you do a transport and then finally ends up having a good result this is one of the way by which you can do a good reconstruction but the shortening when you are doing in the distal femur it cannot be more than 4 cm if you do it then because of the excessive soft tissue bulk you will not be able to shorten it or get the closure done so you have to be very careful in doing the shortening so for example to reduce the frame time you you need to think of lot of various options like you have to get the global reconstruction earlier you can do a double segment transport pre grafting or transport over a reamed unreamed nail all those things you can have a, as a sort of a techniques by which you can red, reduce the frame time however there is also other methods by which you can think of doing the bone loss management see like suppose if you think there is a fragments all around and then periosteum seems to be in continuity you just get a fixation done with the bone graft it can still go on to heal but here in this patient you can see that the uh, screws broke and then we just have to go back in again and then do the fixation the same plate it went on to heal well with a good result suppose when there is periosteum also in that is the fragments are there in place and then it you see it, it seems like periosteum is in continuity you can also get the fibular strut graft in addition bone graft with a fixation again this also will go on to have a good function and also like if these complex fractures sir so when there is a circumferential bone loss so in these instances when you think there is extensive crushing or if there is some amount of contamination then you need to do them in stages and then in those stages that you are doing initially you can do an articular reconstruction in the beginning itself you can do articular reconstruction and later you do a secondary reconstruction here what we have done is taken the allograft so shaped it and then once we shape it in position and then the uh, intramedullary area of the allograft must be reamed and then you can put autograft into that and then once you position it very well and then you can also get it fixed well and this is the fixation that you get and uh, once you do that this is at 4 months you can see little bit of callus is formed all over and then at 14 months it gets nicely incorporated so this is the uh, purely an autograph with an allograft combination and it gives you a good function good result and also like this as i said the staged reconstruction you need, you have to be ca cautious especially when you are doing an extensive crushing of soft tissue or severe contamination always do in stages otherwise you can do a global reconstruction as early as possible however if you think there is a vascularized fibula versus bone transport uh, is being uh, often discussed and they also said that it is the bone transport is slightly better than vascularized fibula because when you do a vascularized fibula you need to protect the limb for very long time so that is why they said the transport is better what we do is because we also have an allograft combination we incorporate it so the capena technique was described for a tumor reconstruction surgeries so we have modified it and then put it for the uh, all these uh, trauma bone gaps distal uh, distal femur bone gaps and then you can see with our plastic colleagues we do both of them together and then once it is done so you just shove in the 
microvascular fibula inside the autograft and then position it and then fix it well and then it will go on to heal so we have we have also published it in a, a trauma uh, series so trauma case reports we have published it and also we have given it in the in plastic surgery department uh, this thing indian journal of plastic surgery we have published it as modified capanna technique we series of 19 patients and then so in what we have learned over the period of time is like both bone transport and this method of uh, technique gives good results only thing is the limb reconstruction system we often use it whenever there is more crushing also when there is a contamination is more whereas when it is just an extruded fragments or when the bone when the wound is smaller then we tend to go ahead and do a global reconstruction with the capanna technique bone gap management is challenging and difficult continuing monitoring is needed actually you need to speak to the patients repeatedly because at any time it can go in for a secondary amputation that needs to be told to them but if it is managed very well it is extremely satisfying so these are the methods by which you can also manage and it is really a pleasure to manage them well and then get a good result thank you thanks a lot uh, dindaran that was excellent and i think this uh, modified kapana's technique really seems an excellent way to deal with some of these bone gaps uh, i think the problem is a lot of a uh, lot of people don't have access to allograft uh, so that becomes an issue so maybe for them uh, transport is probably a better option uh, any uh, so there's questions in the chat box which are coming in late so uh th there was uh, one from uh so there i haven't yet seen any questions on this particular talk but uh if any of the faculty have anything to add here we'd be happy to entertain that so i i i, I just have a quick question for dr ddi uh first off incredible cases incredible presentation wonderful cases and outcomes really remarkable I think that's the reason why we we uh, repeatedly send residents over to your hospital to learn from your experience it's really uh, wonderful. Um a question two questions I have for you one is um when do you decide to take out um large bone fragments uh, there's been some new evidence that suggests that you can actually keep even if they're denuded you can keep some of the bone fragments. Um that's one question and the second question I have for you is when do you decide or do you use at all the mascale technique no remember remember first question is like when do we remove the bone fragments suppose as as normally described we always do the tuck test and if there is a good soft tissue that is there we don't remove it but if it is independent and then if it is any patient who has got contamination suppose if somebody has got severe contamination we almost all of them we remove lots of soft tissue yeah, yeah. so if it is not contaminated there is no point if even, even if there is small number of small soft tissue attachment a very uh, fra, feeble attachment we tend to keep it it is the contamination that will decide whether you to remove it completely or not coming to the next uh, question that you asked is uh, um, okay. yeah. some of the times when there is a small bone gap that is there we tend to put a a bone cement and then keep it often it heals with bone cement itself we don't try to remove it and then go in for a bone graft at second but if there is a medial void if there is a medial side if there is a void and then you keep a bone cement then at those times we have removed it and used as a used bone graft later but we don't specifically call it as a masculine technique as such it is sometimes it is not that we don't do that in 4 to 6 weeks say specific time it takes little while longer than what is described so we yeah. may not be able to classify it as masculine technique so great so we we do use the masculine technique often for some of these large bone gaps uh where we sometimes actually use the plate as our initial fixation and then use a big uh chunk of cement with antibiotics and then at about 6 weeks later we go in and replace it with bone graft The only problem is you often need a lot of bone graft, okay? Because even though these uh, things may look not so huge on the X-rays, when it comes to putting in bone graft, you need a huge amount of bone graft. 
So we sometimes combine our plate with transport as well. So that's something which we've been doing in some of these large defects. So we use a locking plate, but also do something either an Elisor or an LRS to transport. And then as soon as we dock, we just put in screws into the plate and take out the fixator. So your fixator time is just your transport time. You don't have to keep the fixator on for a long time. Because we have the ability for the good teamwork yeah, here, yeah. we just tend to go and do the other techniques. So. Absolutely, yeah. That's so with when you have facilities to do those things, I guess that is a good option. Didi? Okay, so yeah, Rajiv, you have something to say? Yeah, uh, Didi, Didi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, wonderful cases. Uh, will the physiological status of the patient make a difference between decision between bone transport and your modified, uh, you know, capillary safety because of a very badly diabetic patient that we get quite often. No, Which see, like uh, in our population, if you see, a lot of these patients are actually two-wheeler drive uh, vehicle. Young patients. Majority of them are like single limb. So it is uh, purely on that limb only there is an injury. Whereas in a polytrauma <laughs> scenario, we don't tend to do a, a capillary technique quickly. It takes longer time. So they have to get normalized. All the lactate levels, lactate. everything has to become normalized. We don't do a global reconstruction very early. It's always a staged reconstruction. Okay, so I, I think, uh, Hemant, we can continue. One, two, I think Didi is continuing for okay. another talk. And uh, this time he's going to be talking about this. Non-unit. Non-unit. So, uh, uh, Kalyan said it is a case yes. series that I need to discuss. So, it is a non-union of the distal uh, femur. So, it, see like this is one of the patient, like as uh, Greg said that if you position your plate little offset, it can end up having a medialization of the distal fragment. So, that's what has happened in this case if you see. And then when, uh, whenever there is some sort of medialization like this, it automatically reduces the surface area of contact and also this alignment gets changed. So that is only it end up with uh, non-union. So again, it was revised. So it was again revised, but it looks like yeah, it is yeah. the same, same again. So that is why <laughs> it is a problem here. And what we need to do next is the question that any non-union that you are going to assess is going to be on contact, alignment, and stability, and biology. These are the ways by which you are going to analyze. Any distal femur that you have, you must always get a good medial contact. And the alignment must be centered. So your hip, knee, and uh, ankle alignment must be perfectly be centered. And stability, of course, you have to give an adequate stability and then biology, that is the bone graft, you need to add it. So based on these concepts, we are going to have the presentation. And what we did was, we you can see that we got it positioned well, and then you can see the gap between the fem that is the femur and then the plate, we got it little medialized here, the shaft got medialized. But also we added a medial fibular strut graft. When we add a me medial fibular strut graft along with uh, uh, autographs, then you can see it. this is at six weeks and then this is at four months. So it has gone on to heal well. And then it is at one year follow up and they do a very good result. What I did in this case is like, it is not only achieving a medial contact, but also in all these non-unions, we use Muller's compression device. You have to give contact, compression, stability, and the stimulus and then get the perfect alignment. If you get that, then definitely all of them will go on to heal well. This is another patient, you can see that though it's a very distally placed fracture, it is purely because of the failure of this fixation. What we did was like the same thing, like we did again, went back to do the medial strut graft, got the shaft medialized and got it centered. And then you can see that when we have it centered nicely, and when you put it your alignment, you can see that it is completely in good alignment. So it is the key, the alignment is the key and then get a medial contact perfectly aligned and then you have it positioned like this with a good stability, it will go on to heal well. And then like 
this is the same point so if you are not getting that medial contact right it always results in medial void whenever there is a medial void I, it is it is going to fail and that again the same the uh, procedure that we did it is the medial strut graft and then the st stabilization with the centralization of the shaft and also many times when there is a rotation suppose if you fix your distal femur and proximal femur in rotation again you see it ends up with non union in this situations are also it is a question of loss of the surface area of contact and also like it alignment will change completely and then it will result in non union and then we got it nicely reduced you can see that compared to what it was before now you see it is in good shape you can see that between the femur and then the plate there is a gap that we got it so that we get the medial co cortex aligned well and then the strut graft here you see because the strut graft the strut graft we have placed it more on the posterior as well as medial side and that's why you get the uh, see here it is on the posterior side and also on the medial side that we get and then once we get it going then it has a good result gets goes on to heal well so what is important is we need to have a good medial column continuity and then the contact and then alignment must be good and then once you get it then stability and biology is added and then the contact that we also must have a compression so that is muller's compression device you must use to get get all these parameters correct so we have published also this is in the injury journal which we published our 22 cases managed with the same type of method and then like what we also did was we studied on that medial void pattern and then when we studied the medial void pattern what we found it is if it is void is less than 2 cm we can get away with the medial strut graft whereas when it is more than when the medial medial side gap is more we always try to do a medial plating so that is what we thought is the right way of doing and then we, we the, the, that is what we said whenever it is a medial void less than 2 cm is always good to use a strut whereas more it is a plate is better option and this also we got it published in archives of orthopedics and trauma surgery and we also made an algorithm on that so that we said that if it is a good stable fixation and good alignment, only bone grafting would be sufficient in those uh, patients. Whereas on the contrary, if there is a patient who is more than 65 years, whereas inadequate bone stock, you will have to think of an orthoplasty as well in these patients. Whereas between them, if it is a good alignment and then the void is less as we have spoken already, Whereas the void is less than 2 cm, is structural medial metaphyseal strut. Whereas if it is more than 2 cm, it is a medial plating that will be required. So that is what we made it in this and then we wrote it up also. Thank you very much. Yeah, really that was absolutely fantastic. I think uh, the last slide uh, tells the entire story. So, in fact, we were going to ask you about when to use medial plate and you answered the question. So, uh, it's very hard to, <laughs> to know what you've not covered in this and what to ask you. Um, I, I have a quick question, if I may. Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I think that was, again, wonderful. Um, one of the um, tricky aspects of um, the surgeries that you um, showed that you seem to make look easy is, is um, getting the fibular allograft in the, into its correct position because oftentimes the distal segment in the distal femur is, is um, dense bone and also the proximal the, in the canal is usually easier but to really jam it into the distal segment can be a little bit tricky and getting in the right location. Do you have any tips and tricks for the audience to, to help them with that? What I do is uh, we take the DHS reamer so the D, a triple reamer, DHS triple reamer, and then first we pass the guide wire into the position where you want the fibula graft to go in. And then we once we make the hole for the triple reamer to go, and then get the allograft first positioned into the distal side. And once you position it, and then what you need to do is good traction, and then make a small window on the lateral cortex of your distal, that is a proximal femur, 
distal portion of the proximal femur on the lateral cortex make a small window and then push the graft in it will go into the medullary canal and then get it into it so the, get that uh, release the traction it will get into position so Uh, manual uh, traction, no distraction. You only use a manual traction. Manual, just assistant traction is sufficient. <laughs> so one thing, uh, Didi, I noticed that. Uh, so we also see a lot of these non-unions, uh, but we use the fibula less frequently. But what we do try to do is to get lag screws across. Sometimes, wherever it's possible, we try to get in a lag screw to give us additional compression and contact. and uh, i think sometimes that i feel is the key to getting these to heal uh, so uh, that's something so we achieve compression only by muller's compression device yeah but so some of the oblique types it's a little more difficult to use the compression device uh, adequately so there so we would or we use the compression device all the time i think uh, so i think the younger generation seem to have forgotten the compression device or they don't it's difficult to get today and uh, the old compression devices were actually a we lost him complicated and more costly to use so i think uh, we use it all the time for our non unions and i agree with that entirely but we try try to get like when, when we were when we were doing the angle blade plate earlier days yeah then we used to use to, it all the time we used to put that oblique screw often yeah, yeah. exactly as yeah. so, a like so i tend to still try and do it either through the plate or even independently if possible i think that was a really uh, good point um, um i think you, you both probably talk about distal femoral non unions but one is more of a shaft where you have a large segment of comminution and it sort of consolidates yeah. and then there's a oblique fracture uh, oblique right. non union side versus a yeah. just transverse non union side with medial um, comminution yeah. and segmental bone loss and and both you know you've you've nicely um touched on how to to manage them um, uh, both uh, in a wonderful fashion so i i I don't have much uh, addition to that. I do use rea. I just uh, use actually so from the contralateral okay, side yeah. and get um, some some intraoral. Yeah, if you, it's an expensive way of bone, getting bone graft for us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's uh, one question for Dr. Didi from Dr. Sanjay Dawan. In distal femur fractures, if you have a Hoffa element, what is your recommendation to fix it separately only? This is actually for everybody. to fix it separately only or with an anterior posterior screws thing what he wants to know is just screw fixation or plate fixation as well so is this a independent offer or a combination a combination with the distal femur fracture a combination with the distal femur fracture okay no when it is in combination first you get the hope was reduced very well to perfect alignment and then you can do the nailing or plating whatever that you want to do independent of the hofus you can definitely do it and then to decide whether to go ahead with the plate fixation or not generally it is like for example if there is a long posteriorly if there is a sliver that yeah. you need to definitely buttress it you always have to use a plate otherwise if it is a young individual screw itself is sufficient it's sufficient yeah so my my thoughts exactly uh what what we sometimes do is use uh, screws obliquely from postero medial or postero lateral going antero medial or antero lateral in addition to the front to back screws so where you have enough chunk that's a big chunk this works very well so you can put a 6.5 screw here because these are extra articular so we use this compressing with a washer from the postero medial or postero lateral side going antero medial or antero lateral as the case may be now the nails are also available with antero and open yeah actually with locking in different directions yeah in addition to that you can use those type of nails to have a additional purchase sure and one last question before we move to the next talk dr anup has asked about the use of tens nail on the medial side to support the column in <laughs> case any no, thoughts like, on that it probably like in a combinations and then when you are having a medial void situations maybe it is some sort of uh, uh, so it might help because biomechanically we have not we don't know but there are good reports from uh, miraj group where they have said that uh, it it works well yeah the problem is how do you where is it holding in the shaft because it's it's in 
intramedullary. Intramedullary, yeah. But what, what's it holding against? That's the problem. No, it, so, we'll move on to the, so I think we go on to the next session, which is on proximal tibial fractures. And again, it's going to be Arvind next, who's going to talk about uh, the postromedial fragment and dislocation. So I think uh, one must be aware that a lot of these uh, fractures involving the medial condyle are actually dislocations of the knee and it's important to recognize them and treat them accordingly. So over to you, Arvita. Thank you again. So um, we'll switch gears a little bit and now go to the proximal tibia. And uh, my talk will be first on uh, medial tibial plateau fractures or fracture dislocations and when to go lateral. So we've heard from Greg earlier today about the anatomy, about the medial side, which sometimes can be a little bit more difficult than the lateral side. And, and what that is, is it's just less common, I guess, to go medial and posture medial. And what, why is that? Well, there is the, the MCL that uh, really blocks sort of your uh, reduction. The PES is in the way. The semimembranosis is in the way. And then you have limited reticular um, axis in that region. I always like to split the um, on the coronal view the tibia into two portions, the anterior and the posterior portions. And then depending on that, I will decide my, my approach to the proximal tibia. When you talk about medial tibial plateau fractures, you have a multitude of approaches, uh, positions, and plates. Uh, for the approaches, you have um, the direct anterior, medial, posterior medial, in addition to a lateral, and then you can decide whether to go prone um, with, um, as we discussed earlier today, particularly if there's a posterior lateral fragment in addition to that. Plates, we have the pre-contoured, you can use a contralateral tibial plateau plate, you can use 3.5 3 frequent plates or proximal humerus plates, but do not use one third tubular plates as they're too flexible and may fail. In my mind, um, there are, from these um, Schatzka four fracture dislocations, there is two types, one or four types, but we'll talk about two types specifically in this talk. One is where the medial tibial plateau fracture is an isolated fracture fragment, um, and it's usually less energy that imparts through that area, but it still um, is associated with a fracture dislocation of the entire um, knee. And then we have the high energy tibial plateau fractures where you have central and lateral articular depression. And that's really, really critical to um, understand and look for because if you do not address this, as address these points, you will um, um, make the patient probably go and collapse into that defect and um, collapse into valgus. Uh, there's two other ones where um, just with axial um, uh, compression of a um, knee, you get these bicondyl tibial plateau fractions. Sometimes you get a coronal split and you should look for that too because your screws, uh, particularly if you just go from the lateral side, may not adequately um, fix those fractures. And then we've talked a little bit more about the posterior medial shear. So again, the high energy medial tibial plateau fractures are, are you, you, you can see the lateral condylar widening, you can see the central depression, and I will um, show you some cases where you can really um, understand that. There are some variable patterns of where sort of um, in which position the leg has been, and so there can be posterior medial or intermedial fracture um, dislocations on the medial side. And then understand that uh, there's a lot of soft tissue injuries, particularly on the lateral side as the knee goes into the medial, um, follows the medial tibial plateau. It rips off the lateral meniscus um, uh, and also has a high rate of ACL, MCL, and lateral collateral ligament, uh, um, ligament injuries. And in addition to that, obviously, check your pulses, make sure that they don't have a dysvascular limb, check ABIs and, and make sure you, you, you address that uh, with a vascular surgeon as soon as possible. This is just a paper that, that uh, describes the soft tissue injuries, uh, particularly with Schatzka 4 fracture dislocations when, where they found almost up to a 46% of soft tissue injury. So I'll start off by a case. Uh, this is a 76 year old female she was uh, on her way to the church and fell. So rather low energy um, um, and um, rather more geriatric or frail patient. And here you can see an AP and a lateral x-ray of the knee. And you can see um, how the uh, femur goes with the proximal tibia into the medial side. You can see that there is lateral 
in central depression. Um, um, and you can see that more clearly here on the CT cut. And I'd like to um, draw your attention now to the um, lower right corner on the uh, coronal uh, CT scan. You can see that the articular reduction or the articular piece is depressed uh, about two centimeters down into the shaft almost uh, of the tibia. And there's only a very small area on the lateral side that would support the lateral tibial, uh, the lateral femur. So it's important in my mind to address that to avoid having the patient collapse into that defect. So we did, uh, what we did is we addressed it first from the media side, opened it up, um, uh, tried initially to get it from the media side, but realized it was not possible to get that. So we changed our strategy, just fixed the media um, uh, plateau with short screws in the proximal segment to allow for lateral um, uh, based uh, plate construct in the future. Um, you can still see the uh, lateral depression there. Now we made a small little anterolateral um, approach elevated that um, a large depression, um, placed preliminary K-wires, uh, applied a lateral uh, based locked plate, lateral x-ray, and then uh, placed long screws over the, over the uh, uh, articular segment, and then and finally placed some bone substitute um, um, or whatever you'd like to use into that large defect. And this is the final outcome. And this is the, um, the different fracture, the, the rather um, um, uh, sort of just the medial fracture, but it's still a fracture dislocation that you have to be very careful about. Here you can see that most of it is just medial. There is no central lateral depression. This one you can just all address from the medial side. You do not have to go lateral. One a nice trick is to use a large periarticular clamp, as you can see in that image, um, and, and apply it to the medial um, femoral condyle and the lateral tibial uh, plateau as it pushes over the femur back onto the lateral side and reduces the fracture. That usually helps you with a reduction of your, of your uh, medial side, and then you can just apply a posterior medial plate or wherever the apex may be. And she was back to skiing after this accident. So it's really uh, important to understand uh, what, what the fracture pattern is and plan your incisions accordingly. I usually go medial if the um, apex is either anterior um, to the mid-coronal line or if I see an MCL injury on an MRI or if there is a need for going posterior medial. I go medial and lateral if there's a lateral joint impaction, if there's central joint impaction that I can't access from the medial side or if there's meniscal involvement on MRI. And we briefly talked about the posterior approach and why, why to go posterior. So I won't go into that detail a little bit more. Again, there's um, uh, four types, uh, two types we particularly discussed now, um, the isolated media articular injuries, and then the high energy type four with lateral impaction. Um, I'll finish up with another case that uh, is a little bit of an odd case. Um, as a young um, uh, male, um, also skiing accident, he um, um, sustained this um, hyper um, uh, extension injury. And you can see here um, the subtlety of um, posterior lateral joint depression uh, as well as a, a posterior medial uh, fracture. So we addressed that from, the, from posterior medially. And after applying the uh, buttress plate uh, on the posterior medial side, we used a bone temp from the medial side through the fracture um, and tamped it up and placed the screw and applied some, some substitute in that um, uh, um, sort of channel. And he had a very good. And then finally, just a regular posterior medial shear just be very careful and assess for where the apex is because the apex will tell you where your implant should be. And this one was just fixed with the posterior plate. So with that, um, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you. Yeah, great, uh, uh, Arvind. And uh, while uh, the questions come in for this one, there was one from your earlier talk on uh, what your indication would be for a fibula osteotomy. So maybe you could address that while the questions come in for this session. Fibula osteotomies, um, uh, while, uh, you know, if your fascia around the knee are, are not so difficult, uh, they're not very common. And, and because the, 
the fracture needs to be directly posterolateral. It should be sort of hidden behind the fibula. And that's very rare uh, as that seems to be a fairly um, con um, stiff construct in the posterolateral corner. So usually they don't fail through the bone. If they do fail, they fail through soft tissue. Um, and so therefore, um, uh, it's usually not necessary to go there. Um, but if in case um, I decide to go there, that's when there is posterior lateral depression that I feel I can't go through and can't get through from the, either the media or just the soft tissue releases on the lateral side. Yeah, so I think uh, I've, we've occasionally seen where the posterior lateral fragment is off, actually completely off and rotated and there to get really good visualization, I think the fibula osteotomy gives you the best uh, uh, option. But as you said, it's not needed that often. Um, so, so I think it's uh, the point you brought about this lateral impaction with the meter. That's very important because very often you'll find that if you just try to buttress it from the lateral side, from the medial side, you're not able to get that lateral uh, widening reduced and there I think it's important that you have to also go laterally to get that reduced. Do you find that or what is? Yeah, I think I think it's really important. I think that the um, more often than not, I've been um, um, uh, expectantly not surprised when I go laterally. I almost go lateral. I go very very often laterally, even if I if I don't see a central lateral depression, just because of the high rate of meniscal injuries on the lateral side that you obviously neglect if you don't look. Uh, and it's a point. very small approach. It's it's it takes only five ten minutes. It's really not a big deal. Uh, there's no wound complications usually on the lateral side. Um, so I think it's it's worth doing. You can also employ if if really. Um, you have a problem um, uh, getting access to the lateral depression, you can do an osteotomy too there. Um, that's been described. You can do that if, if necessary. I try to avoid it if, if, if I can, but it's absolutely, um, you know, it's pretty straightforward and easy to do. You just put an osteotome, <laughs> gap it open, get access. Sure. Uh, any other comments from any of the other faculty? Otherwise, we would get on with... No? Okay. So, so we'll uh, you. continuing with proximal tibia, we'll move over to Greg. And a common problem of the bicondylar tibial plateau fractures when to use single plates and when to use dual plates. Day to day practical problem. Very good. So let me get back to where I need to be here. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk about bicondylar tibial plateau fractures. And the main thing that I wanted to discuss uh, with this talk is the reason uh, for going with two plates versus just one plate, because this seems to be controversial in the United States, and I'm sure it's controversial in many other places in the world. And you've already seen my disclosures. So I'm, the objectives of this talk, this is a big topic but I'm going to just distill it down to review some methods for comminuted plateau fractures, <clears throat> when to use a single plate and when to use dual plates, only discussing bicondylar fractures. And I'll review some cases. So bicondylar tibial pl plateau fractures do need stabilization on both sides, okay? So we can do this in a number of ways. So we can just put a plate on medially and laterally, or we can just do <coughs> laterally based locked plating. Okay, that will stabilize the medial side, <clears throat> but there are some things that we need to watch out for. So that's why I say beware. Now we can certainly supplement our fixation, our internal fixation with an external fixator, whether it's a ring fixator or a standard single plane external fixator. But I think that most, uh, most surgeons will try if they have the ability just to use internal fixation for, for most tibial plateau fractures. So the question is, when do I need to plate on the medial side? And I would suggest if there is a substantial amount of medial comminution that you should probably consider putting a medial plate on. And if there's a substantial amount of medial displacement on the injury, 
which would imply a loss of cortical support on the medial side. So you may say, well, <clears throat> what difference does it make if I get good alignment? Why not just reduce it and use a lateral locking plate? So lateral fixed angle implants may work fairly well for injuries like you see here. Okay, so if you look, this is a fairly complex tibial plateau fracture. And you can see a very large injury on the CT scan of the lateral plateau with a lot of depression. But you can see this would be a Schatzker 6 type of injury and uh, probably high energy. This would be somebody you would be worried about compartment syndrome. But the important thing to notice is what's going on medially, okay? There's a tiny bit of comminution, but it looks like you may actually have some place where the cortex will support itself. And so <clears throat> going on to fixing it, this might be a case where a laterally based locked construct that you can see here would be perfectly acceptable, primarily because you've achieved a really good reduction and you have cortex that is touching on the medial side. So you have cortical support. If you think about this, the tibia is subject to some varus forces. And so if you're going to use a laterally based plate, then that plate is functioning as a tension band. And you know that tension bands do not work well <clears throat> unless there is support on the opposite side. So it may be that if you have, if you lack support medially, that you will get away with it and it may turn out fine, <clears throat> but you don't want to do that. You would prefer to come close to a guarantee that it will work. In this case, the laterally based, <coughs> excuse me, tension band plate <coughs> is, <coughs> is functioning appropriately, being that you have cortical contact on the medial side. You can, of course, see the small rim plate that was applied as well to help deal with the depressed segments. But the purpose of this case is to show the cortical contact medially with a single locked lateral plate. So there's medial cortical support. <clears throat> so let's look at this patient. This is another patient. This was an open tibial plateau fracture with compartment syndrome that occurred in a motorcycle crash. And you can see a substantial amount of injury to the lateral tibial plateau, but you can see a relatively straightforward medial tibial plateau injury with potentially some good cortical contact. And we were able to exploit this exact uh, problem uh, by using just a laterally based block construct that you see here with good cortical support medially. There was a separate tibial tubercle set of fractures, which was why we placed the medial, excuse me, the anterior plate that you can see here. So what are indications for dual plating? And these, this is where I would suggest that you consider doing dual plating. The first is a bicondylar plateau fracture with significant injury to the medial tibial plateau. The second is a bicondylar tibial plateau fracture with substantial medial condyle displacement like you see here. And the third is a medial tibial plateau fracture only. So this is a Schatzker four, but with a substantial amount of lateral articular injury that you may be able to address better with a lateral rafting plate. So you saw this in my first talk, uh, looking at the idea of an, an anterolateral plate uh, being used to stabilize a posterior medial fracture fragment. You see, it doesn't necessarily work very well. This is, a, this is from a paper by Dr. Bure back in 2006, which looks at a proprietary implant of one of the companies. But the bottom line is you can see that the blue screws travel in a particular direction and they do not really capture that posterior medial fracture fragment that you can see outlined in white. So using only laterally based locked implants, be careful. If you have a loss of medial support for your laterally based tension band, it can be a problem. You can have minimal fixation in the most important fragment, that posterior medial constant fragment. It is possible that variable angle implants may help, 
but I would still be careful because you're not really getting very much, very much fixation in there. And then remember, <clears throat> it, just because you're doing dual plating doesn't mean you don't use a locking plate. However, for me, I generally don't feel the need to use a locking plate if I'm using dual plates. Sometimes locking plates are helpful with osteoporotic bone. So here's an example of a patient. You can see here a very a fairly small posterior medial fracture line. You can see it indicated by the yellow arrows. This would be something where you probably wouldn't be able to get very much fixation into there from just the lateral side. You can see how we go through the process of achieving a reduction. You can see we've got multiple pointed reduction forceps to achieve that. But then in this case, we actually were able to direct a bunch of screws posteriorly utilizing a variable type of angle construct. You can also see that there are some independent fixation screws on the medial side. So in this case, we were able to achieve cortical support and we were able to achieve fixation. I would say that this is something that you should approach very carefully and very thoughtfully because I wouldn't normally do it this way. What about dual plating of bicondylar fractures? Forget about the, the patella fracture that had been treated elsewhere a long time ago and has been sitting like this for years. But this patient has got a very bad uh, tibial plateau fracture with substantial fragmentation, you can see. But in this case, we were able to achieve quite a good reduction. And all we did in this case was use two medial-sided buttress plates. You can see these are small, these are thin plates. They're called one third tubular plates. That is a uh, brand name of, uh, by one of the companies, but pretty much any company has got very similar plates like this. The reason we use two is because there was a coronal split in the medial condyle. So we wanted to get two different plates on to be able to secure it. And you can see how the dual plating worked here. And what about when you have comminution in the metaphysis? In this case, once again, dual plating helps to provide added support. This plate that we used is a non-locked plate on the lateral side. This patient had very good bone. So you can see that we put an extra buttress plate on the medial side, in addition to some plate, a plate and screws to be able to control the tubercle fracture. And then here's a patient with just was in a motor vehicle crash, just blasted tibial plateau, you can see. And once again, treated with medial and lateral plates. You can also see that the patient had an isolated medial condyle fracture of the distal femur as well. So plating is a really good solution for proximal tibia fractures. You want to make sure that you reduce the fracture before fixing it. You should really know your lateral and medial surgical approaches. It's really important to understand the plate function as each implant is being applied. And so beware of the temptation to use exclusively lateral implants for bicondylar fractures. Thanks very much. Thank you, Greg. And you've uh, covered that really nicely. Uh, you mentioned about two approaches. Do you ever use a single mid midline approach for bicondylar fractures if you've if you're sure you're going to use two plates? No, so I never do that. Um, and I know there are surgeons who do single medial approaches to do medial and lateral plating, but it doesn't seem to make very much sense to me. And, uh, and historically, there is quite a lot of literature that tends to speak against using a single anterior approach because it can cause uh, problems with viability of the bone. Uh, and cause wound problems. But to me, even if, even though there, I know there are surgeons who, who do employ it routinely um, and that perhaps get good results. But for me, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because most often when you're going to get the medial side, it's poster medial where you need to be. And so putting a poster medial plate on through an anterior incision seems to be extremely difficult and I just don't understand it. Some surgeons will say <laughs> that maybe it's a good idea to do an anterior midline incision 
because that would be the same incision that somebody's going to use for a knee replacement later. And so, and my answers to that are number one is if I do standard incisions and then the patient needs a knee replacement 20 years later, I don't think the scars really matter. Sure. And number two, the risk of needing a knee replacement after a tibial plateau fracture is five times greater than that for the general population that does not have a tibial plateau fracture. But that five times increased risk is still a low risk. It's only about 8.4% of the population as assessed through a registry study in Ontario in Canada that was published by Richard Jenkinson and colleagues from Sunnybrook Medical Center in Toronto, where they showed an 8.4% risk of needing a knee replacement if you have a tibial plateau fracture at some point later in life. But you can also interpret that as that means that 91.6% of patients with tibial plateau fractures never get a knee replacement. Right. So, so I don't really care. So I will use dual incisions whenever I'm doing taking care of plateau fractures. There's so a question for that is usually that when the knee replacement surgeon does his knee replacement, he doesn't worry about what incision we have to do for their very prosthetic fractures. <laughs> uh, Greg, there's a question about the ACL injury associated with the bicondylar fractures. How do you, how do you take care of uh, ACL, both avulsion as well as ligament injuries? Do you do anything about oh, what it? What a great question. I, I love that question. Um, because I'm at, I'm at a center. So I, I know I showed some CT scans and I will show a CT scan in the, my case presentation in a few minutes. But um, generally, we only get MRIs at my center for all tibial plateau fractures. And the reason for that is because two of my partners uh, are Mauricio Cafuri, who is a very known internationally recognized knee expert from Brazil who works with us now. Um, and James Stannard, who is my boss, and is also an internationally renowned knee reconstruction expert. So I have two partners who do all of the knee dislocation reconstructions in the central United States. And um, so for me, getting the MRIs, which delineate ACL and PCL and other ligament injuries, is important because I don't take care of those injuries myself but I have partners who can. And so what I will do is I will often, before I, before I fix the tibial plateau, if I know there are ligament injuries, I will ask my partners uh, if they have any suggestions regarding where they would prefer me to put incisions so I don't hurt them for what they need to do. Um, but then they take care of the ligament injuries. I would suggest that if you have that resource both getting the MRI easily and also having somebody who is really good at ligament reconstruction, that you employ those resources. I would say the, that most orthopedic surgeons don't do anything about that. They just expect that the knee will stiffen up. And that's probably true. But until somebody proves otherwise, I know there's not great data, but until somebody proves otherwise, if you have the ability to take care of ligament reconstructions, in somebody who has a tibial plateau fracture and ligament injuries, it seems to me that it would make sense to do that because we take care of ligaments around fracture dislocations of the elbow all the time. Why wouldn't we do the same around the knee? So Quick question again, before we close about removal of implants in these complex fractures. Do you, when do you advise <laughs> that? Do you routinely do that? And what so, about Concerns about stress injuries after removal. Oh, whatever. I never advise patients to have their implants removed. I, I don't see any reason to do that. The patients get a second, second surgery. They get a second anesthetic. Um, I'm busy enough that I don't need to take implants out to, uh, so that I can continue getting paid a salary. I, I, I just don't see what some orthopedic surgeons in the United States for sure they always plan to remove implants. And I just don't understand it. Um, now, if a patient comes to me with a problem that's related to their implants, absolutely, I'm happy to take them out. 
If I can verify that the patient's implants are causing trouble, then I will certainly take them out if the patient wants me to do that. Um, but I'm not going to talk a patient into having surgery to take care of something that doesn't seem to be bothering them. The only time I take implants out in a planned fashion is if there's been an infection. Um, so even if I can get the bone and the wounds to heal, if they've previously been infected, then I will usually take the plates out because we know that osteomyelitis can come back at a later time, many years later. And so I will, I will often do that for somebody who's had a complication, so an infection. But aside from that, I don't plan to take plates out. So I'm not sure if uh, Arvind, if he has any thoughts about that as well, or any of you. I, I don't take any hardware out. Um, um, and it's, it's oftentimes, even uh, if they say uh, the, the plate is the offending agent, oftentimes it's really the post-traumatic arthritis, that's, that's, and they confuse that. And, and so, so you have to be very, very careful, to Greg's point, to really uh, be sure that the pain that they have is coming from the from the plate and screw construct, and rather from the you know otherwise you do a surgery for no good reason and you subject them to unnecessary anesthesia and and the risk of infection even. So I don't right. I don't take them with me out. Yeah. So yeah, and and you'll never have a patient who is more unhappy than somebody who comes to you and says, "I have a lot of pain." please take my implants out. And you say, sure, I'll take the implants out. It'll relieve all of your pain. And you take the implants out and they still have pain. Yes. They were very unhappy with that. So, Indeed. Yeah. So in India, we have some patients who just want their implants out. Okay. So it's, it's, we have sometimes a hard time convincing them it's not necessary. Certainly the posterior plates, I would not remove. Uh, sort of, I would really have to need to remove it for a particular reason where you're having to do a reconstruction or something like that, where you have to remove it. Sometimes the anterior plates can be a little prominent and create a problem. So yeah, there I would say, okay, we'll remove that. But otherwise we have a hard time convincing some of these patients not to have their implants removed. Yeah, sometimes you're right. Patients just, they get really fixated on wanting their implants removed. And I just tell them, I'm like, I, I don't guarantee that you're going to be any better. Exactly. Absolutely. If you really, really, really want it out, then of course I'll do it. But we need to have an understanding that I may not make your symptoms better. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks, Greg. We'll go on to the Great. next one. Yeah, okay. So I think next is uh, uh, Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee. I think proximal tibial fractures is one area where we see a lot of complications, either related to the soft tissue or the um, uh, fixation or uh, malunating fractures. And I think we have Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee who's going to tell us about complications in proximal tibial fractures. So over to you, Rajiv. Yep, thank you. Uh, so while we are at it, uh, just to share today, I had a patient who has had 19 screws put into a proximal tibia, just four weeks post-op for a follow-up. And the first thing she asks is, when can I have these plates removed? Hello, can you hear that? Yep. Can I start? Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You need to make it full screen. Yeah, I'm just doing it. Just okay. So, right. So, uh, next few minutes we're going to discuss about proximal tibia fracture complications. To make it a bit simple, I think I'll call them problems rather than co uh, complications, and they could be grossly divided into soft tissue, which could be because of the trauma, which could be blisters, and compartment syndrome. Just we have touched on uh, on this topic a few minutes ago, and it could be also because of the surgical exercise. It could be a vascular complication, a bone complication, which could be either an articular problem or a juxta articular problem. So just to may, uh, just start off with the case, a 52 year old male fell off a scooter. This was about uh, two years ago, and looking at this fracture per se, you see there's a lot of metaphyseal combination. There is a widening of the articular surface, and within eight hours, this is what happens. This is what we need to be aware about, that these blisters sometimes come on within eight hours, and sometimes, unfortunately, happens after you have operated on them too early. So you need to be very, very careful. The soft tissue is the key to success in these fractures. These soft tissue problems come in different shades of gray, just a bit of bruising, to a few blisters, 
blisters to blackening to a near complete degloving of the proximal tibia. And I think all of you have a huge collection of these. There's just a small little collection that I have. So what to do with these blisters? And the blisters are two types. One is clear fluid blisters, which are separated within the epidermis, or you could ha be having black or hemorrhagic blisters where the separation is the dermal epidermal junction. And that is quite often not like an open fracture. So you have to wait for them to heal. You just can't go in early. So waiting could delay between seven to 14 days. And while you're waiting, it's just not putting them into a plaster. You need some form of temporary stabilization like external fixator, which keeps the fractures from moving about and causing more shear damage. So the span, scan, and plan method. How long you wait? The same gentleman I showed you, seven days post uh, fixation, still the skin doesn't look good. 14 days, skin looks good, and that's the time you go in. So it depends on when the skin looks good, is the blisters have settled down, the epidermis has healed over, that's the time you go in. Compartment syndrome, if you're going to do a decompression, remember it has to be a good thorough decompression. It, ha it could be also be a fibrillectomy associated along with the compartment. If it's that tight, you need to do a full thorough decompression and then later reconstruction to get a good result. Can you predict it? Yes, this is a lovely study from in 2017 from Geneva. They looked at uh, 269 fractures over five years, looking at clinical and radiological predictors of acute compartment syndrome in tibial plateau fractures. Obviously, the higher Shaska, higher AO grades were associated, along with if there was associated tibia fracture or knee dislocation, along with a tibial widening or a significant femoral displacement ratio. If you had that, you had a higher chance of having a acute compartment syndrome. Along with, obviously, young age population males because they tend to have a more of a high energy trauma. So be we aware that the more complex the fracture pattern, more chance of having a compartment syndrome, which needs to be addressed as soon as possible. What happens if you miss it is an utter disaster with infection, non-union, multiple surgeries, and might end up with an amputation. But the real killer combo is if you have an inadequate fixation with poor handling of soft tissues, a combination like this can really be a wrecker and end up in an amputation. Come to vascular injury, uh, this has been touched by a previous uh, speaker. Uh, any dislocated knee, any high Shaska four or fives, they are associated with vascular injuries. So give a story of this gentleman. I wasn't doing a clinic and somebody just said, there's a fracture proximal tibia coming. I said, okay, put a, you know, splint on, push him in the, uh, put him in the ward, I'll come and see him at a very busy clinic. And this was a picture when I walked, and nobody told me about this, when I walked into doing my round six hours after finishing my clinic, and this chap had a vascular injury. Late recognition happens, so please be aware. Sometimes edema around the ankle joint, you can't feel the pulses properly. You have to do a ankle brachial index. You, if you are in doubt, get a Doppler, document it, because these fractures have a high incidence of vascular injuries. We had to rush into OT, spent about 12, 10 hours with a vascular surgeon and my fixation, and we finally got the patient back. From soft tissues, I move on to bone and joint problems. The, it could be broadly divided into either articular malalignments or metaphyseal malalignments. Articular malalignments could be either postromedial or lateral in the form of depression or articular widening. So let's take one at a time, and I will share some of my own disasters, which I have learned from. This is a gentleman whom I treated about 17 years ago. I didn't have... No, I didn't have a very good idea about fixation possibly at that point of time. Um, didn't have a CT scan at that point of time. And so I went in and fixed it and look at it. I missed it completely. I have not put the plate on the apex. I have left a double uh, articular sign. And this is an utter disaster which I've left. So learning from that, what you need to do in the neck, that if you have a, a case like this, a postro or medial or medial chunk of bone, you need to get good imaging to get a CT scan because it tells you where is the apex. We kept on describing where is the apex. The apex needs to be found out, reduced by a good exposure, buttressed with a proper plate in a proper direction. The plate has to go in at the apex and this will prevent complications because if you don't, and if you miss it, you can get a malunion 
in the posteromedial area. If you get it, the plan would be to do a intraarticular osteotomy and plan it before you go in. The planning has to be done before you go in. So a good posteromedial exposure, do an osteotomy at the apex, raise the whole flap of bone up. The gap can be filled up with uh, uh, tricalcium phosphate and the apex needs to be buttressed and fixed with a plate. So osteotum, start from the apex, go into articular, raise the bone up, put some support TCP, bone, uh, bone substitute, and put a plate at the apex to prevent a slide back. And with that, you can have a good result. This is one uh, from John's uh, collection. His ones look much better than mine. I don't know how he does it. Come to the lateral articular depression. This is another case about 17 years ago, split depression type. I fixed it with this. These, you don't get this place any longer, I think. And see, I've compressed the fracture, but I have missed the depression. If I had got a good CT scan, I found out it was not a central depression, it was a posterior depression. So you need to get to the area of articular depression, raise it up and buttress that area instead of just doing it blindly. So what is important is to do a good some meniscal arthrotomy, open the flap of bone out. So even if you get it late, do an osteotomy through the old fracture line, open it out, go to the articular segment, tamp it up, raise it up. If it's a fresh case, no need of bone grafting. If it's an old case, put in tricalcium phosphate um, granules in. Once you've done that, close the flap of bone down, compress it, put wires in, put a plate, repair the meniscus down. So everything has to be done visually. The same thing that you would do in an acute case, do it also in an old case, where you do osteotomy to the old fracture side to raise it up. Come to the next problem with the articular widening, another of John's collection, which I borrowed from him. So you have articular widening and a metaphyseal uh, malalignment. So it's a complex problem. So in an articular widening, what you can do is plan, do an intraarticular osteotomy, along with do a Decompressing osteotomy, take a, a, it is a reduction osteotomy you do, okay? Free it up, do a reduction osteotomy, clamp it together, close it, pass a screw to hold and compress, first compress the articular surface, decrease the breadth of the tibial articular surface, then do the metaphyseal osteotomy, then put your screws in. And this is the result you should be getting. So do a debulking osteotomy, remove the callus in, from between the two old malunited fracture fragments, hold it together, clamp it together, hold it with a screw and compress and then add the plate. Come to metaphyseal malalignment, a 52 year old lady had this fixation done elsewhere, came to me four months post-op. I was brave enough and this is about uh, six years ago. I put a Elizarov on, did an osteotomy, compressed it together, a realignment, Elizarov, but I forgot that she, she didn't tell me she has psychologi psychological issues. She went to somebody else, got the Elizarov removed in three months and presented it to me at six months. So this is about uh, 10, a year since the index fracture. And this is what I have. So the only option was freshen the area, dock the fracture together, use the Muller compression device, compress the fracture together using a good strong implant, bone graft the area. So docking, compression, getting a good sturdy implant, bone grafting to get a good result. So in summary, prevention is better than cure. The good, going to back, back to my, the first case that I, we showed, you need to make sure these blisters settle down, the soft tissue needs to settle down before you go into your scalpel, otherwise you're looking at a disaster. Once you have done that, you need to identify the articular fragment, get a good CT scan. Identify the articular fragments, plan your fixation in your mind. Put your screws in your mind when you want to do it. So you put your, you know where your compressions will go in from. Next is you plan your subcondyl support, plan your metaphyseal realignment. And remember, each column has to be supported by a separate hardware. You might need three plates I did it in this case. And this is six months post-op with a good alignment, metaphyseal, good articular alignment, and good articular support to give a good result. So the take home is, Remember, soft tissue is a key problem. Make sure you don't face it. So be careful with the soft tissue. If need be, wait. 
If you have a blister, allow the blister to settle down, treat it like an open fracture. Do not miss a compartment syndrome or a vascular injury, especially in the high grade AO and Schatzker fractures or ones associated with dislocations or one associated with tibia associated fractures. It's clinical examination, span, scan, and plan. So clinical examination comes first. Identify the problems early and deal with them. Intraarticular malalignments, avoid them. If it happens, uh, intraarticular osteotomy, graft and fixing. Metaphysical alignments, again, avoid them. If it happens, treat them early, correct them, do the osteotomy, correct them, compress, dock it properly, and fix with a robust implant so that you don't have pictures like this, but you have success stories like this. Thank you and wishing everybody a quick deliverance from this pandemic. Stay here. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks, Rajiv. Uh, that uh, brings us to question time again. And there's one question asking about why use an external fixator because you may have pin track problems. Can you just put them on skin traction or a slab? Uh, two things: the skewering effect. The the blisters happen because of the skewer. The, there's a the shearing effect. Shearing effect cannot be taken care of with a skin traction or a pin traction because shearing will happen if you leave them loose. So uh, you need an external fixator and your pin tracks have to be planned away from your screws that you plan. So you have to plan your screws that you can put in. So pin tracks are away from there. You see my pins are anterior posterior and they're far away from my, uh, you know, the, my fixed implants. So there's another question which uh, is really for other anyone is that for the posteromedial fragment, do you prefer a prone approach or a supine? Yeah, Rajiv, you can go for uh, it. Well, if I'm doing a pure posteromedial, then I would do it prone. But anywhere where I think I have to go lateral or any other, um, you know, I have to put a lateral plate in, I would do it supine. Yeah, I think, uh, Greg, do you have any references? Absolutely. I do all of my posturing approaches in the supine position. <clears throat> I discussed that during my surgical approach talk. <clears throat> I also discussed it uh, during my um, bicondylar plating talk. Um, you can do it prone. I mean, I think that's fine, but, um, <clears throat> you know, the... You can get easy access in a supine position to the posterior medial fracture fragments. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, uh, the anesthesiologists prefer the patients to be supine. Um, it's a comfortable position for the most part for most surgeons. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing it prone, <clears throat> but I think that most people, unless they really need to get directly to the back of the knee and use the approaches that Arvind discussed, um, I think most people would do them in the supine position. I don't think anybody would fault you for doing it prone, though, if that's how you were comfortable. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think, I uh, especially if you have a bicondylar fracture, which you have to deal lateral and medial, definitely the supine is uh, the better option. I think some of these uh, posterior fractures, the fact is that they reduce when you extend the knee, a bit like the buttons. And so there's some advantage in going posterior. And if you have to go posteromedial and posterolateral, which is not often, but does happen sometimes, then definitely I would prefer the prone position. Yeah. Greg, yeah. Yes, yeah, Greg. I'd just like to make a comment regarding the external fixator question that was asked earlier. Yeah. Um, there are really so many good reasons to use external fixation instead of a splint, yeah, splint or skin traction. Um, <clears throat> number one, External fixation will do the best job of maintaining length while you're waiting for soft tissues to recover if you're not going to be fixing, it, fixing a plateau fracture right away. So the external fixator will do a very good job with that. Second, uh, the external fixator will not cover the skin, so you can monitor the skin if there are problems with blisters and things like that. Third, the external fixator does a much better job of maintaining stability than a splint or skin traction would and that provides patients with comfort. Fourth, the stability that the external fixator provides also helps to protect the overlaying soft tissues. Fifth, if you do an external fixator, you need to be careful about how you do it 
pin track infections are not common. If you are having common pin track infections for external fixation, you should consider why you're having those infections. Being very careful with how you handle soft tissues, keeping pins out <clears throat> of the field of injury, so keeping them distal on the tibia and above the knee capsule when you put them in the femur, uh, making sure you pre-drill, always pre-drill. Do not put self-drilling pins in without pre-drilling because you will burn a cortex and you can cause soft tissue infection from bone necrosis. And I don't care what the biomechanical studies show, always pre-drill. You don't save a lot of time by avoiding the drill. So pre-drill, irrigate when you're drilling and put your pins in by hand so that you can feel when you're across both of the cortices. If you do everything carefully, an external fixator should take time you can avoid pin tract infections. Thank you. That's all I needed to say about right. that. So with that very emphatic answer, I think we can go on to the next session. Rajiv, can you stop sharing, please? So our next session is by Greg once again, and uh, it's on further complications, case of compartment syndrome with proximal tibial fracture. Okay, so um, thank you. So I'll just briefly talk about uh, tibial plateau fracture. This is a case of a tibial plateau fracture complicated by a compartment syndrome. I think it's a perfect case to follow uh, the great talk that we just heard. <clears throat> so, um, but this is a really good case because I think that um, this type of thing, this exact patient is the type of person who would have a compartment syndrome missed. And it was actually missed at an outside hospital. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. So this guy, he's 53 years old. He's otherwise, he's pretty healthy, <clears throat> um, a little bit obese, which is pretty common in the United States, especially in the mid portion of the United States. Arvind sees fat people, um, but not as many as we see here in Missouri. So, um, so he fell from a ladder only about three feet Okay, so not very far, maybe a little bit less than one meter that he fell. Um, so that's not too bad. He landed on his left leg um, <clears throat> and he had an injury to his left knee. He was on, wasn't really able to walk on it afterwards. And so he went to an outside hospital where they got x-rays. They saw that he had a tibial plateau fracture. They put him into a knee immobilizer and they discharged him from the ER with instructions to follow up in the orthopedic clinic to talk about surgery. <clears throat> so that's where the problem of course started because you will see when I show you his x-rays that there's not much displacement. Um, he's otherwise pretty healthy. He only fell three feet. His fracture is not very displaced. So they splinted him and sent him home. So the next day he was having a lot of trouble. <clears throat> and so he called to get an appointment with the orthopedic surgeon, but they said that they would not be able to see him in clinic for one week. Okay. So, but he was having excruciating pain in his knee and in his leg. And so, because he had trouble at the other hospital, because they told him they couldn't see him for a week, he came to our hospital. And when he presented, he had severe pain in his leg. Uh, they were not able to, they gave him an IV, they gave him IV opioid medications, and they could not control his pain at all. And they called orthopedics uh, after they got x-rays that showed the plateau fracture again. And on the exam, he had normal pulses, and he had normal sensation throughout his foot. His foot was warm, the typical things, but he was writhing in pain. He had pain that was uncontrollable. And anytime his toes or his ankle were moved, he was jumping off of the bed. He was not, he was sweaty. He was clearly agitated. There were things that were not right. <clears throat> so in the setting of this type of a, uh, of a situation, this is not somebody where you need to take 
uh, needle and stick it into the compartments to determine whether or not the patient has a compartment syndrome to measure compartment pressures. This is a guy who clearly has compartment syndrome, okay? And remember that pulselessness, uh, pallor, which is pale skin, um, cool legs, otherwise known as poikilothermia, uh, those things are not what you're looking for for a diagnosis of compartment syndrome. If you get to those places, then you are in trouble because that means that the compartment syndrome has progressed so far that you really don't have, you have a dysvascular leg. Ideally, you pick this up sooner, even before they start having paresthesias. And in this case, this guy had severe pain and pain with passive stretch of his muscles in his leg, but no other signs. And so we took him to the operating room. You can see these are his x-rays. And you can clearly see that he has a bicondylar fracture. The lateral condyle fracture is best seen in the image on the left. And the medial condyle fracture is best seen in the image on the right. Okay. So, but this is a pretty innocuous looking injury. It doesn't look that bad, but clearly he has a bad problem. He also has a comminuted fracture of his fibular head. You see that there. So you can understand why if the patient's not having much pain, the emergency room at the other hospital may have sent him home. But I think it's really important to uh, keep an eye on these patients for a little while. Don't just see them in the ER, splint them and send them home right away. This is probably somebody who they perhaps should have kept in the ER for a few hours to make sure that he was doing okay. So he received external fixation. And, and in this case, the reason that he was uh, put into external fixation uh, was primarily just to stabilize the leg, to assist with keeping that fracture from shifting around and from causing any further bleeding or anything like that, that may have been causing his external, his uh, compartment syndrome. He had fasciotomies on the medial and lateral aspects of his leg. I usually do two incision fasciotomies. Um, I find that I have an easier job getting to the deep posterior compartment from the medial side. And so I always do two, in, two fasciotomies instead of just a lateral fasciotomy which is described and it's actually just been described and published out of Seattle. Um, you can see here that we did not close the incisions. You can see the staples with the, uh, with what looks like a <clears throat> cross hatching that those are vessel loops that are helping to keep the skin somewhat closer, uh, but not all the way closed. And then we put a vacuum device on. And so he, once we got the uh, once we got the external fixator on and we got the fasciotomies done, he was in much better shape. We did get a CT scan. You can see some fine detail on the proximal tibia. You'll also notice that his distal femur, he has an old fracture of his distal femur that malunited. He's got some arthritis in his knee from that. That was present. That was probably 20 years earlier, but it was healed didn't really give him much trouble. You can see here on the left is the uh, is a CT cut in the sagittal plane uh, through his medial tibial plateau. And on the right, you can see the lateral plateau fracture and the fibular head fracture. And then this is what a uh, representative cut through the, through the knee on a coronal plane image shows the bicondylar nature of the fracture. You can also see osteophytes forming in a lot of different places that are probably the result of his old, healed, malunited distal femur fracture. So he went back to the operating room on three different occasions for washouts. We were able to get his lateral wound closed quickly, but his medial wound was the one that was really the difficult one to close. We ultimately were able to close them definitively. And you can see that the skin looks pretty rough. Okay. It looks bad, but uh, I think the more important thing to take away from this is the size of the incisions that were made for fasciotomy. They are long incisions. These are not the types of patients where you should be making a small incision, okay? Skin heals side to side, not end to end. Make a long incision and make sure you get the entire compartment released 
and make sure you get all four compartments. Know your anatomy. <clears throat> At 17 days, we performed definitive fixation. I went both medially and laterally. I started off on the medial side, got a good reduction. You can see here with the buttress plate, added a lag screw across the medial condyle, and then went to the lateral side. This is a, this is a locking plate, but we used non-lock screws. Um, and so this is not a locking construct. And we were able to secure it without too much trouble. He did not get an infection, which is unfortunately a risk when you have fasciotomy uh, prior to fixation of the tibial plateau. This is what he looked like immediately post-operatively. And then at seven months, he is healed. Now, unfortunately, compartment syndromes and fasciotomies are associated with problems with the skin. And he has a lot of difficulty with itching and rashes and things like that. But he walks on this. He has no difficulty whatsoever. He is back to doing normal activities. He does not have any pain. Um, and, uh, but he's convinced that his rash is coming from his plates. So unfortunately, this is a guy who I think we're going to end up having to take his plates out because he is convinced that the rashes that he's getting on his leg are from the plates themselves and not from his compartment syndrome and his fasciotomies. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Well, Greg, thank you. And I think the real point to take away is uh, have a high index of suspicion and think compartment syndrome, and that's really the key. Uh, we are a little behind time, so just a very quick single question for you is would you ever consider same sitting fasciotomy and internal fixation? This is a question from one of the participants. Any circumstance we do it at the same sitting? Say fasciotomy and definitive fixation. Fasciotomy and definitive fixation? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure that I would necessarily do that. Uh, I think I think I would have to be, I think I, I would really need to be convinced that the, um, I really need to be convinced that the soft tissues were ready for me to put a plate on. So I would suggest probably not. Um, another reason for that is that I'm usually at least leaving one skin wound open. And so I prefer not to have exposure of my plates once I've put them in, even though I'm going to be putting a vacuum device on, I still prefer not to have exposure to the plates to the environment. So, so I would suggest I almost always do an external fixator. And I know I'm coming back to the operating room on multiple occasions to get the wounds closed afterwards. So we'll have plenty of opportunity to fix at a later time. Yeah. I think we are a little behind, so we'll probably move on to the next talk, John. Yeah, okay. So the next session is on periprosthetic fractures, and it'll be mainly in the form of case discussions. And the first case is by Arvind, uh, who's going to tell us about uh, a periprosthetic fracture and how he's dealt with it, and the advantages of the use of the uh, femoral distractor when you're dealing with this. So over to you, Arvind. Arvind? Are you there? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, I'll stay for a moment. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Here you go. Let me uh, pull up my, my talk. Oh. So we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about distal femur fractures again. So um, uh, what I will focus on with this talk particularly is, is um, uh, the usage of a distal femoral distractor in uh, distal femur fractures. Uh, this is what it looks like right now actually in, in Boston, so it's very pretty with everything blooming. Um, I'd like to um, uh, 
give a shout out to to the co-moderator and and um, uh, Dr. Della Rocca, who has published a nice um, paper on the the projections of periprosthetic fractures in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma, and um, just highlighting the fact that it actually um, the despite our advances with total knee replacements, we still there is a really a big need for 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 understanding how to best treat these periprosthetic fractures be, because they're on the rise. As we know, we have lots of different treatment options, including lateral lock plating, retrograde nail fixation, nail plate uh, combination that has uh, gotten some, some press in the past couple of years, and then uh, distal femoral uh, replacement if, if uh, you have poor bone stock or, or if you have a very um, old patient. The lateral lock plating uh, system is, is really to allow a fixed angle fixation that avoids the varus collapse that we've talked about. Um, and it allows for less less invasive or rather more picketing displacement of it. There's now multiple generations, and really it's it's pretty much the standard of care for, for most of these uh, periprosthetic fractures. So now I'll dive a little bit into three different areas. One is the distal placement of the plate to maximize the fixation and purchase above a previous implant. I'll talk about the femoral distractor and then um, using a pin to control the coronal plane alignment. So this is an 81-year-old female who's had a, uh, um, a previous hip fracture nailed at an outside hospital and has now sustained a peri-implant fracture um, um, uh, between the nail as well as the total knee replacement. These are more usually more unstable than you think they are. The x-rays do not really uh, tell the whole story. Uh, if you take them to the operating room, they're very unstable fractures. So here, what you can do is if you plate your lateral uh, based locking implant, either slightly posterior or anterior, you can absolutely um, get around the previous implant and do not have to actually remove the pr prior implant, which is um, obviously much less surgery for the, for the patient. And this is uh, her getting back to her original level of function. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, my favorite toy, the distal femoral distractor. I use it very often, um, even though I have plenty of assistance and help. I do think it, it uh, makes the case go much easier and, and much more relaxed. Um, and you can control the fracture in a, in a, in a more controlled fashion. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful tool to familiarize yourself and really use it for as many indications that you have. And I here is just a, a sort of a sawbone model to show you a little bit about how I do it. Um, the pins obviously you place uh, percutaneously. Um, you um, uh, should, as previously mentioned by Greg, you should uh, pre-drill them and, and put them in the hand to avoid any uh, problems uh, related to thermal necrosis of the bone. There are, are some papers that look at, for, particularly for, for femoral traction, distal femoral traction with a pin, there is some mobility to, to X-fix pins, so I, I try to really minimize it by, by a very soft tissue friendly technique. Um, the bar, the sort of the metal bar should be on the um, opposite side of where you um, do your surgical approach, meaning the, uh, here on the media side, so you have the lateral side free. And it's incredibly important uh, when you place these pins that you are uh, don't place them in two different um, uh, positions on the femur and tibia because if you then pull traction through it and uh, realign them only afterwards, you induce malrotation. And that's really difficult to do because oftentimes you'll put a bump underneath the hip. So they're internally rotated. So when you look at the leg and you try to realign everything, you externally rotate the hip, you may induce a lot of external rotation. So it's really important to keep them coplanar with your, the with your rotation. So here is an intraoperative um, um, a picture where you can see the uh, femoral uh, distal femoral um, uh, um, a distractor applied. Initially, we over distracted them, but then we could fine tune it and just release some of the traction to allow for some compression, and apply our laterally based locking plate. And she was back. I, I usually when I have. When I'm, I'm happy with my uh, play position and my construct, I actually allow them to start weight bearing at three weeks. This is another one, um, a little bit higher up, um, distal uh, peripacetic femur fracture. Again, so now I'd like to uh, 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 show you what I do to um, control for the coronal malalignment, the, the gastroc pull on the distal segment, as Greg alluded to earlier. 
So I put my um, femoral distractor on and then I put another chance pin into the distal um, segment. Uh, and that allows me to uh, essentially get it out of that flexion deformity. And then I use just a regular uh, lap sponge to and a schnitt or some sort of clamp and then fine tune my, 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 um, my perfect alignment. And that really is a powerful way of not having to move anything around or obviously you can use bumps to help with that, but that pin, if you have good bone stock and it doesn't um, rip through the, the bone, you can really use it and it's very, very helpful and effective. Obviously, obviously check, uh, check on the AP and lateral intraoperatively that you've really restored that. And here's just another picture of uh, where I apply my clamp. Um, I go around the distal uh, femoral, uh, the, the distal pin into the tibia and sort of um, uh, clamp it as needed. And this is sort of the radiographic view where, where you essentially put it right above the, the total knee replacement. Sometimes I even impale it as distal as possible to get as maximal purchase because sometimes they can loosen up and then pull on it. And then you can get a fairly good result. I think one note about the distal femoral distractor is when you place them, you can see the previous hole of the um, pin in the femur. Always make sure that you actually place it uh, so you, you overlap it with the plate to avoid having a stress riser. And that's all I have for you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, great, Erwin. Uh, that was nice. I think uh, the femoral distractor is definitely a very useful uh, tool to have with you, and uh, uh, it, it helps you in um, multiple situations. So definitely a good thing. So where uh, 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 would you consider using two plates in a periprosthetic fracture? I think as we alluded to earlier, I think if you have a large amount of uh, comminution or a large segment of uh, medial bone that you can't, that you're afraid to, to um, hold, it's essentially a cantilever pro um, product uh, similar to the proximal tibia. And, and I think it's not well defined right now. The data is not there yet to, to tell you this amount, but I think anywhere between um, six to 10 centimeters of medial sided um, uh, uh, comminution or large segment of bone that's not supported with cortical apposition, you should really start thinking about uh, placing a, either an intramedullary uh, plate or a plate on, over the top. And I, you know, as it was alluded to earlier, it is not a difficult approach. Um, it is not, um, it takes maybe 20 minutes to, to apply it because uh, you probably get your reduction before that. And, and so I, I really think it would be a, a very good idea to do that. I should challenge you when you have these distal femur fractures and uh, you fixed your construct, uh, you can even think about um, just stressing it under fluoroscopy and you'll see the amount of flexibility that you still have, even though you have uh, um, locked it up uh, nicely and, and you'd be surprised how much flexibility there is. So, so just um, as a word of caution, do not rely on the, on the lateral based uh, construct. And in fact, I think if you provide the patient a more stable uh, fixation, you can probably feel more safe about uh, letting them wait there early. Yeah, I think uh, the very distal fractures very often uh, have a posteromedial beak and uh, it's good to try and buttress it in that position and then put a long plate on the lateral side. So that's something we do quite often. But uh, yeah, uh, did you want to add something? Sometimes the bone stock is so low, only one or two screws would go in and then exactly yeah. all unique article you place. Yeah. And even the prosthesis gets in the way. So it's good to then put in a buttress on the medial side because very often the medial side, I've seen this uh, as a pattern seems to be quite common is where the, it's obliquely lateral to medial. So it goes uh, proximal to distal if you go medial to lateral. So you have a bigger chunk on the medial side which you can buttress quite often. So I find that useful to do. Okay, so... Uh, that's great. I think since we are kind of running a bit behind time, we'll hand it over to Hemant for the next session. Yeah. So uh, continuing on periprosthetic fractures, 
uh, we'll have Rajiv once again, and uh, he has a case for us on uh, periprosthetic fracture of the distal femur, Rajiv. Yep. Uh, yeah, I come back again. So this uh, uh, this lady is a 50, 58 year old lady. She is a healthcare worker. Uh, comes from Dhanbad, which is about 150 kilometers from Kolkata. She had a knee replacement three years ago, and just now, as we discussed, uh, I mean, we used a lot of PS implants for this because when we started off, she had uh, some sort of seronegative arthropathy. Not very sure what the, the rheumatologists had put her on steroids. When we started off three years ago, she had a range of motion 10 to 50. Had actually done an MUA before starting off, then went on to do a knee replacement. Post knee replacement, we just got zero to 90. She was quite happy with it. She was back to doing her activities and uh, moving on. She was a community nurse for three years. Unfortunately, had a fall in the bathroom after three years post knee replacement. As this is how she presented it to me, shortened and in varus. So the plan was taken to OT, and I and this is, I didn't use a femoral distractor as I had two uh, very good assistants who had helped me doing the distraction. So pulled the femur out to length, made sure the there was co contact on the medial side, corrected the val varus to valgus. So three things: length, alignment, and contact on the medial side. Once that happened, then put in multiple wires from the medial side to hold. The reduction, then went in, selected the variable angle plate. And here, the important thing is when we are doing these sort of uh, fractures, you need to hold kitchen sink as an inventory. So I had all sorts of plate, including the variable angle plate, including the revision implants. We don't know what happens on table, whether it's loose or not. So variable angle plate. The advantage is, especially with the PS implants, where the lot of bone is. See, this is a size two implant uh, PF sigma, so there was hardly any bone distally. We could angle the screws distally. That's one thing. Second is important thing is to get the plate seating centrally proximally because it tends to skive off anteriorly. So you need to get once you've got your reduction right. Next thing is to get your plate positioned right on the femur, the AP and the lateral view, especially lateral view proximally when you need it centralized. Once you've done that, putting the screws and especially variable angle screws, you could go in slight uh, in an angle direction. So, unfortunately, even with that, we could only get two long screws distally. Rest were short, about four short screws distally, and proximally there was a long segment fixation. I don't know why I put the second from the last. You could have just done with those three screws. The 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 third screw was useless. I put it in to centralize the plate. And I didn't take it out because it was only already holding on there. Immediate post-op allow gave her a splint, allowed supervised mobilization intermittent, active range of motion only within pain limits. After about two weeks, one stitch removal is done, allowed a full range of motion, but did not allow any uh, weight bearing for eight weeks. Again, to note that we made sure that the medial contact was maintained. And as uh, John was saying, this posterior medial beak, I was a bit afraid that this would slip, but I had good two long screws and three more screws distally, and a long segment fixation. Three months post-op allowed her. She was walking full weight bearing at a range of motion five to eighty degrees. She went back and happily disappeared from my screen. Six months later, she came back again, mobilizing independently. Again, went back. She comes back two years later with a distal radius fracture. She falls too often, which I had to plate. And during that time, when I took an X-ray, this fracture healed off beautifully, and she had no complaints with this knee whatsoever at all. And actually, yesterday I did a video call with her. She is home isolating. Is five years post trauma. She is retired now, and this is a range of motion. She can extend nearly fully, and she has a range of motion up to 90 degrees, and she is quite a happy last now. So the important points is get an early fixation, early mobilization. When you're doing it, important to get your valgus alignment retained, a good length, and you need to get your medial cortex realigned. Try not to open out and strip soft tissues. Do your minimally invasive technique. A VA plate is a great option in these cases because, especially with the P 
PS implants. There's hardly any bone left, so you need to get an angle in to get at least two or three screws in good fixation modes, getting both the cortices, which is difficult. Important to have a long segment fixation with screws spaced out. And the second plate, as we have already discussed, the second medial plate, I would keep for low fractures, especially where the exit of the medial fracture is at the level of my implant. And that is where I would put a second plate in, but I know there is not enough purchase with my lateral plate alone. Thank you. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks, Rajiv. And uh, that really brought out the point about the pattern of this uh, mm. periprosthetic fracture. It's a common pattern. Now, do you think that the VA plate actually saved you from the medial plate? Or do you think a conventional locking plate would have done the same job? Uh, with the PS medial plate that you used? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 had, I had tried it on. So I had kept a normal plate and a VA plate. So when I tried on the normal plate just with the K wire, all just I just could get one screw, which was engaging both the cortices. With the VA plate, I got at least two screws, and that gave me a feeling of, you know, feeling of added stability distally. Because especially this poor bone stock, especially the PS implants. Correct. If it's a CR implant, you can put any plate in. With the PS implants really cramped for space in the distal fragment. Absolutely. And I think you had a depew implant, which has a bigger box. Yeah. So the amount of bone removed from the center. Quite a bit. It is a size two implant. It uses a, it takes a lot of bone out. And I had to do it because it's a zero negative, zero negative arthropathy. And when I started off, she had hardly, she had just five to 80, even after MUA. So I wanted to have a good stability after stripping all the tissues down. Yeah, so there was a question from one of the, uh, the, the delegates on the previous talk uh, about is the retrograde nail out? So would uh, Rajiv or Arvind want to comment on that? No, I think the retrograde is no. You just uh, is is great as a great option. Yeah. Just you have to be um, really understanding one which implant you have. Yeah, one trick to use is if, if you're unsure about the size of the box of the uh, total knee replacement and you're not sure there's a paper that will tell you exactly the size of the box of the various implants as in a journal of arthroplasty, I think 10 years ago. But if you do not have access to that paper, you can also just get a <clears throat> notch view just before you get started. And with the notch view, you can actually see the width of the, of the, um, of the notch of the total knee replacement. The other part that's really important to know is, is you always will get a little bit of an extension deformity as you place your implant in because of the notch where it is will sort of pre-determine your trajectory of the nail. And you should also know that um, um, what, uh, you know, how much bone stock do you have distally and what, what fixation yeah, you know, options you have distally because that, that really makes uh, or breaks the thing. I, I try to use uh, nails um, as much as I can, but oftentimes most of these fractures are just very distal. The implants that I have do not allow for a lot of these oblique uh, fa um, um, lock blocking or locking screws through the, through the nail. Can I just add to this? Can I? John, can yes. I? Uh, oh, yeah. The other slight worry I have is once I'm reaming in, there's a lot of debris which floats around. How so good you wash it? Micro, the worst, uh, you know, the, for, for wear and tear of the implant, the micro, uh, you know, the little microscopic bone dust that I might be leaving behind could possibly later on cause, I mean, I don't know, that cause cause a macrophage activation because that's because larger fragments don't cause macrophage activation. The smaller fragments that do. Well, that does so. That's the worry I have. That's the reason I've never done a nailing. I've always done a plating. That's the worry I have. Yeah, I, I guess there's not too much evidence for that, but I think nails certainly will work if you have an open box and it's a more proximal fracture. Yeah. But if it's really distal, then I think yeah. most people would prefer plates. Okay. So I think now we come to the last talk, and this is uh, uh, from Dr. Hemant Kalyan, and he's going to again talk to us about periprosthetic fractures and uh, talked to us about a spectrum of them and uh, a tale of three cases. So let's see. Uh, we end up in a, with the last talk for today. Hemant, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, just a moment.
Uh, yeah. Not yet sharing the screen, right? Yeah, good. You seeing it? Yeah, sure. You need to go. Yeah. For you. Are you seeing the screen? Yes, we can see it. All right. So, um, in this presentation, we're just going to talk about a little bit about using an algorithmic approach to managing periprosthetic fractures of the distal femur based on classification. So, just three illustrative cases. Now, the classification system in periprosthetic fractures has evolved over the years. Back in 1999, the first system was a very simplistic system, which just identified whether the prosthesis is loose or not, and whether the fracture is displaced or not. Obviously, recognize recognized the importance of loosening. And then Edward Sue in 2004, recognized the importance of the fracture pattern, and especially the low fracture pattern, the type three, where the fracture line, at least part of it is distal, to the anterior flange of the femoral component. And this is important for our management protocol. And then back in 2018, there was a very nice publication in Journal of Trauma, which combined the various systems into the United Classification System for periprosthetic fractures, which addressed all the various types. And in this, the type B, which occurs uh, in clinical practice. So here's the first case, 70 year old female, resident of our neighboring city of Mysore. I had done a bilateral TKR, same sitting for her in 2011, known case of rheumatoid arthritis. And she came to me in December 2015 for a routine four-year checkup. Once a year, she comes and says, hi, doing well, uh, good movement, 115 degrees, doing all the normal activities. Four months after that, that's about four and a half years after the uh, after the last visit, she had this kind of a fracture, exactly what John was talking about, the distal, you know, the oblique fracture line with the medial peak. And uh, this happened in a home city of Mysore. So she went to a local uh, surgeon. This according to the, is a B3 fracture, even though the prosthesis was stable, uh, it is about four years down the road, but poor bone quality makes it a B3 fracture. And this is what was done by the surgeon in Mysore. He used a, uh, a tibial, tibial, tibial plate in the purse. And, uh, you know, you might argue that this might be a day one failure because inadequate fixation proximally. The attempt at the interfragmentary screw was half-hearted. And uh, you might say it's a day one failure. Inevitably, it failed just two months down the road. She was uh, non-weight bearing at the time, didn't do anything much, mechanical failure. And at this time, she came to me uh, because I had done her knee replacement in this situation. And as was alluded to earlier, I did keep the option of a revision available as well as converting it into a dual medial and lateral um, plating system. So when I went in, I found that the, uh, the prosthesis was very well fixed and there was absolutely no sign of loosening. She had no pain before. So we went with our plan A and added on a medial plate. So I happened to use the same lateral plate, just repositioned it and uh, redid it. Now you can see the lateral plate is more towards the center. There was no need for an interfragmentary screw. We had a medial plate added on to that and no bone grafting, adequate proximal fixation. We had plenty of screws. And then as Dr. Deen Dalan said, you know, the, the opportunity for screws in this is less. So we had medial and lateral screws, which gave a stable fixation. And uh, this was a situation one month post-operatively, she had achieved 110 degrees on CPM and about 90 degrees actively. That's where she was at about a month post-operatively. At seven months post-op, she was walking with a stick and we can see the uh, adequate amount of posterior callus and bone healing quite uneventfully. And at one year post-op, she was healed and uh, did very well. Unfortunately, just about six weeks ago, 
Uh, she succumbed to the pandemic infection and died of COVID. This is about four and a half years, five years after this fixation. So the take home message here is that if you have a situation like this and don't get adequate medial stability, dual, dual plating is not just a salvage procedure, but is a good initial choice. And I feel if in doubt in periprosthetic fractures with poor bone quality, better to do a dual plating if in doubt. Now here is another case, again a rheumatoid arthritis lady who had come and met me in 2020, just before the pandemic hit uh, India in a big way, 54 years old, and she had had a re knee replacement done elsewhere in 2008. At this stage, she was 12 years down the road, symptomatic loosening, and I had suggested to her a revision total knee replacement. Pandemic came, and uh, she obviously didn't want surgery at that time. Unfortunately for her, a year later, that was in February 21, this year, she came with this situation. She had a low periprosthetic fracture, a B3 type of fracture. We had already advised her a knee replacement. So the decision making was simple, that loose prosthesis, again, a B3 fracture. So the B3 fracture, uh, there was no question of trying to attempt a fixation. So we did this for her. This is a link endoprosthesis uh, with a cemented stem on either side. And then here it's really important to try and get a whiteout of cement on either side. The, uh, the gap is fixed and you can play with the polyethylene. Here we had five centimeters polyethylene uh, construct, which was added on to the femoral component. And I must say that this gives very good stability so this is the situation just at two weeks post-operatively when she could do a, a, a leg raise quite comfortably and uh, walking full weight bearing at two weeks without much difficulty. This is a more recent uh, video uh, where she is walking independently at just two months post-operatively pain-free, 90 degrees of movement. Very rarely you get more than that in a hinge prosthesis like this. So the take home message from this is that the rotating hinge prosthesis gives an excellent early return to function. But of course, she's only 54 years old now and we worry about the next re-revision which might happen in another 10 years time. Here is another case, this time an osteoarthritis lady. Uh, I had done a bilateral same sitting knee replacement for her about two years ago in uh, 2019 and uh, she was doing fine and a year and a half later she had this type of fracture so this was a year and a half uh, post-op intact prosthesis and uh, the fracture well above the uh, the implant so in this case the obvious choice was fixation it was a type c fracture and i used this nail plate combination so uh, in this, we use the anti-grade femoral nail with three lock screws and uh, that gave the relative stability and to really augment it and convert it into a near absolute stability. I added on a cable ready plate on the lateral side. This was the AP X-ray and this was the lateral X-ray done relatively recently. And uh, at just four weeks post-operatively, she had remarkably good function. She's regained the range of movement that she had before the injury and she also managed to uh, achieve uh, unassisted SLR at just four weeks post-op. And this is her walking at uh, four weeks post-op confidently with uh, very little support of the walker. At six weeks, this was uh, uh, the situation where, you know, you're really seeing uh, a very good stability with a nail and plate combination. And um, this helped us to rehabilitate her quickly and efficiently. So the takeaway from this is that a stable fixation facilitates early rehab in these type of fractures. And a nail plate combination is something we can think about uh, in these type of fractures. So that was just briefly what I wanted to say about the algorithmic approach to these fractures based on classification.
Thank you. Thank you, Emant. Great. That was a great way to end the day. Uh, there's some questions. One was about the approach that you would use. And there's another question about, uh, uh, we've come to, let's do the approach part. And the other question is about the notch view. Well, when do yeah. you do it and how do you do the notch view and what, uh, what is the advantage of doing it? So the approach in the, uh, uh, the first case, there was already a lateral approach and I did the medial plating from the, uh, from the TKR midline incision. So she had the midline incision for the TKR, the lateral approach, which was, uh, which was already done. So uh, redid the lateral as well as the uh, midline incision. There was a good six, seven centimeters gap between them and they went on to heal uneventfully, as we said. About the notch view in a periprosthetic fracture, it's, uh, uh, I don't normally do that. I don't think it's useful. It's better to get a CT scan done if you're really doubting about the rotation. And if you're doing a revision, in any case, you're putting in a new prosthesis. If you're doing a, 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 a fixation, I don't think the notch view is really going to contribute much. Rajiv, what do you say? Do you do a notch view in periprosthetic? No, no it's, it's impossible to get a proper notch view. There is so much of pain. Yeah, absolutely. It's very difficult to do that. In that I, I tried to clarify that uh, because I brought it up. I use a notch view um, really not so much uh, preoperatively, rather intraoperatively when the patient is asleep. <laughs> That's a lot of, yes, I, I don't do that preoperatively. We usually try not to torture our patients too much. <laughs> they, will kick, they will kick us out of the hospital. The ratings will go down. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think the notch view is helpful just particularly when you have a native uh, knee with a testal femur fracture after you put your fixation in to ensure that uh, um, you limit the amount of screw that goes through the notch itself. And, uh, so you flex up the, the knee and then you uh, tilt the C-arm, sort of you look right down into the, uh, into the notch of the, of the knee and that helps you to um, make sure that you have no screws in the notch. And that's really the, one of the main advantages where I use it often. Great. I think that brings us towards the end and uh, we can have some final uh, closing comments from all the faculty, starting with Rajiv and we'll... Uh... Well, my message is, remember, it's just a soft tissue, then span, scan and plan. We tend to forget the soft tissue. Remember, soft tissue is a very important comp component in proximal tibia fractures. Uh, Didi? Oh, I wanted to bring in the various methods of treatment for uh, on, uh, distal femur bone loss. But the only thing I knew, wanted to convey was like more the crushing and con contamination, better to go in for transport. If it Otherwise, you can go in for global reconstruction in the form of any other method I discussed. Right. Of course, for a non-union, the basic concept I wanted was like lesser the medial void, you can in a fibular uh, allograft on the medial side, more the medial void, uh, plate fixation is better. Thank you. Uh, Arvind? Uh, first off, thank you for the invitation. It's been a lot of fun and a, a lot of great discussions. Uh, thank you, really. It's been great. If you remember anything of my talks, don't forget about the posterior medial uh, tibial plateau and use the femoral distractor as much as possible. Hemant? <laughs> uh, hey, yeah, I think uh, just to say thank you to everybody. It's been a very engaging session. We've had a very nice discussion. Uh, you know, excellent cases, stuck to time. It's been a great teamwork from everybody. Just a big thank you uh, from us to all of you. It's been lovely interacting with you. Yeah, great. And so thanks, everybody. I think uh, the Malunian talk was basically to make people aware that this, these are not that uncommon and uh, there are methods which, by which we can deal with them to prevent uh, going straight into a total knee replacement. So uh, hopefully that would have been useful. But I think again, I'd like to thank all the faculty. Greg has had to go away, so he apologizes for not being here right at the end. But uh, thank you everybody for uh, taking part and giving us a great uh, sort of uh, insight into the work you're doing and also 
uh, educating. Thank you, John, Hemant, Arvind, Rajiv.